introduction of guests, the Honorable Premier. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to my colleagues for another uh, week of debate in the legislature. To all those who are joining us at home and all those who are joining us in the uh, public gallery today, Mr. Speaker, I guess uh, allow me the privilege to be the first to recognize in the Speaker's gallery the new leader of the Liberal Party of Prince Edward Island, Sharon Cameron, uh, who was officially announced Saturday, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome her to the legislature. I look forward to the contribution you'll make in the, in the weeks and years ahead, so thank you very much and congratulations. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I also wanted to say uh, congratulations to uh, Corey McPherson, who was the winning driver in the uh, Red Shores Drivers Challenge at uh, the racetrack this weekend. He won the Paul Dinger McDonald Award uh, with uh, 62 points in this year's Drivers Challenge, uh, finishing just two points ahead of Amber Campbell, uh, who is the, uh, the top women's driver in Atlantic Canada, and, and Amber uh, finished second in that competition. So to all of those at Red Shores, uh, who have participated and put on another first-class event. I say uh, congratulations and to Corey McPherson. It's good to see your hard work and dedication pay, uh, paying off, uh, Mr. Speaker. I also wanted to say uh, thank you and congratulations to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital Foundation uh, who had their Yuletide Gala on Saturday at the Delta Charlottetown. Uh, uh, that event raised $367,048, Mr. Speaker, which will be used for a new uh, hematology analysis system uh, for the hospital. So to all of those who organized and, and contributed, thank you very much for that worthwhile cause. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to say that although it's still a few days away, that on Saturday morning uh, I will be hosting uh, the... Uh, what used to be an annual Salvation Army kettle campaign kickoff. Uh, we were a little, uh, we hit a pause uh, during the COVID times, Mr. Speaker, but we're excited to, uh, to kick off that uh, campaign again this Saturday uh, at the Hunter River Lions Club. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's by donation only, and this will kick off what is a most worthy uh, campaign for the Christmas season on uh, the holiday season that's conducted by the Salvation Army all across PEI. So if you happen to find your way out to Hunter River on Saturday morning, we'd love to see you at the Lions Club. It's a great event for a great cause. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Down to the leader of the official opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I too would like to welcome everybody to the gallery today and a special welcome to Sharon. Congratulations, Sharon, on your victory on the weekend. And I look forward to working closely with you over the years to come. Um, I'd also like to welcome to the to the gallery. I see a couple of regulars here today. Toby McDonald and um, uh, Debbie Graham, excuse me, are here with us, and they come in frequently, and I think enjoy the entertainment in here a lot. You keep coming back. It's lovely to see you again amongst others who are here. Uh, since September, uh, Pauline Howard and Makina uh, Tariccia and a group of other volunteers that be meeting regularly at, at Makina's uh, commercial kitchen, which she has. And they've been cooking, amongst other things, soups um, using food, which is either donated or they have gleaned from somewhere. And they deliver the soup and the meals that they make to the community fridges here, uh, fridge here in Charlottetown and, and elsewhere. And on their next day in the kitchen, the group are going to be baking cookies. And anybody who's interested in volunteering. It's a wonderful group. It's uh, organized through the Food Exchange PEI, and Pauline Howard is an absolute force of nature when it comes to keeping that group going. So if you'd really like to help out in stocking out our community fridges at a time when many people are struggling to keep their own fridges full, uh, please get in contact with Pauline through Food Exchange PEI, and they'd be happy to have volunteers there to help bake some cookies. Um, the Canoe Cove Community Association AGM is going to be held uh, next week on Monday, uh, November 28th at 7.30. And it's always a, a lovely event. Uh, Canoe Cove is not a large community, but they are one of those uh, places on Prince Edward Island where the community, the One Room Community School, has been retained and used for other purposes. In this case, it's their community hall. And they always, they always put on a great show, and it's fun to be there, and new members are, are always welcome. But it's a place I always feel there's a great, tremendous sense of community in Canoe Cove, and I always enjoy visiting them uh, as people in the community themselves and the lovely old schoolhouse there. Um, the South Shore United Church uh, next weekend is holding uh, the annual Sorensen Family Christmas Concert. Um, those in this house, I'm sure, will know many of the Sorensen family, Jack and Arlene, 
uh, have been tremendous movers in their community for a very, very long time, and they're both musical, as are many of their kids. I'm thinking specifically of Dale and Jacqueline here, but there are others who will contribute. It's an annual event, which is very, very lovely, and they, they feature original stories and personal experiences of Christmas past, and it's just it's beautiful musically, it's beautiful aesthetically in the Tryon Church, the United Church there, and it's also a, a, some lovely music will be played. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I was pleased to hear, and I guess we haven't had the official announcement yet, but finally, uh, PEI will be joining many of the other provinces in getting a full carbon rebate. And um, finally, Islanders will be getting all of the money that they deserve um, through the federal backstop. It's good for Islanders, it's good for our province, it's good for our economy, it's good for our environment, and um, I'm, I'm really glad to see that. And. Uh, I look forward to debate on that in the months and years ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to welcome everyone back, all my colleagues and everyone watching from my district of Angelina Scush and all Islanders. A special welcome to everyone in the gallery. A very special welcome to uh, Daniel Larder. And I see Gary Watts is here, and although you're a Toronto Maple Leaf fan, Ooh. who still who still talks. So it's great to see you here. Mr. Speaker, Saturday was a big day for our party supporters, and will in turn become an important day to remember for Islanders across the province. I'm a bit lighter today in terms of titles, at least, <laughs> as on Saturday I passed the torch to the, to our new leader of the Liberal Party of Prince Edward Island, Sharon Cameron, who is joining us in the gallery. And welcome, Sharon. Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate and thank Sharon for her commitment to our party and to all Islanders. The energy in the room Saturday was electric, was electric and infectious as we welcomed Sharon. She has a heart of gold, a brilliant mind, and a can-do attitude, and I, continue, and I can't be more excited to see what she will accomplish in her new role. Once again, congratulations, Sharon, and welcome to the gallery today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, welcoming everybody watching today, especially those in Kensington Malpec. Uh, I want to take this time, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I know my parents always watch. Uh, my mom's a faithful watcher, and even my father started watch, which really surprised me because he doesn't have a very long att attention span. So, uh, <laughs> anyways, I want to say hello both to, to mom and dad, and uh, I want, also want to say uh, thanks to my department, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's a lot of work goes behind the scenes in my department, and they don't get a lot of credit uh, behind the scenes. So so uh, I can't thank them enough for all the tremendous work that, that they have done and will continue to do, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today, Mr. Speaker, is National Housing Day, and uh, we know that our housing situation has a profound impact on our overall well-being, Mr. Speaker. Um, I look forward to making announcements in the near future uh, that will directly support creating greater access to housing across Prince Edward Island. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Mr. Speaker, and hello to all my colleagues, everyone tuning in from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, around the island. Hello to everyone in the gallery. Special hello to Sharon Cameron joining us today. I look forward to working with you. And as mentioned by the Minister, today is National Housing Day. And uh, the theme this year is everything starts at home. And as we reflect on that, you know, if you don't have a home, where does that leave you? And so I thought I would take this opportunity to simply reiterate that housing is a human right for every person in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to rise today to congratulate Cornwall Charlottetown KOA Holiday Campground on receiving the 2023 KOA President's Award and the KOA Founders Award at the recent International Convention in Orlando, Florida. The KOA President's Award is given to campgrounds meeting high quality standards and receiving high customer service scores from their camping guests. In addition, KOA's Founder Award is KOA's highest service award and is given to KOA campground owners and managers who earned world-class scores in both customer service and KOA quality review. My daughter's first job uh, was at KOA for, for two summers and it was a fantastic experience for her to learn and the focus on customer service there was second to none. I want to recognize Cornwall Charlottetown KOA Holiday Campground, their owners the Gray Group and General Manager Donna Sentner along with Abby Center, who is the manager of guest services, who work tirelessly to provide every guest with exceptional service and the best outdoor camping experience in North America. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Shine Valley Shorebrook and the opposition whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today and say hello to everyone here in the gallery, including Toby McDonald and Debbie Graham, uh, as well as new Liberal leader uh, Sharon Cameron. Congratulations to Sharon. Um, speaking of passing the torch, today the Canada Games torch relay is taking place in Tyne Valley uh, later this afternoon. So I wanted to acknowledge the torch bearers that will be engaging in, in the torch uh, relay this afternoon. Melanie Phillips, Erica Wagner, Barb Ramsey DeRoche, Shelley Campbell, Ann Robinson, Rowan Caldwell, Kenley Noy, Jenna Smith, Jared Caldwell, Colin Dillon, Marie Barlow, and Shauna Lee Wisemere. It's going to be an exciting afternoon, and I wish everybody well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's certainly a pleasure to rise today. Welcome back to all my colleagues. Hello to everyone tuned in online, and thanks to those joining us here in the gallery. And a special uh, thanks to Sharon Cameron for joining us, and certainly a, a big congratulations to you, and I look forward to working with you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to give a shout out to the Community Legal Information and PEI Human Rights Commission for the partnership in creating valuable resources for Islanders. They created two new videos that explain how to identify workplace sexual harassment and what options are available to address it here on Prince Edward Island. They were launched today at the beautiful Charlottetown Library Learning Centre and I have to say it's always a pleasure to participate in events at the new library. For those of you here and everyone uh, listening today, I want to share that the RISE program offers free legal support to victims of sexual and intimate partner violence and workplace sexual harassment, and the SHIFT program and project aims to address and prevent sexual harassment in island workplaces through awareness, education, and free tailored training for employers, employees, high school students, and the general public. So Mr. Speaker, uh, if you've experienced workplace sexual harassment, if you're an employer looking for more information, please contact the RISE program or the shift project. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, um, for allowing me the opportunity to share these, this information uh, around these important resources for Islanders. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, it is a pleasure to rise here in the legislature this afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome everybody and say uh, hello to everybody that is uh, watching in online, certainly those from the western part of the province up in District 26, Albert and Bloomfield, Mr. Speaker. And uh, welcome everybody uh, to the gallery here. And certainly, Sharon, great to see you. As it's been said by others, I uh, certainly look forward to working with you. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this week, November 20th to 26th, is National Addictions Awareness Week. This year, the week spotlight will be on how different communities across the country are helping those in their community. It's about showing how collaborating as a community of care makes change happen. On PEI, we have a strong network of community services for people with substance use disorders. I'd encourage anyone with concerns about addiction to contact the Mental Health and Addictions phone line at 1-833-553-6983 for help or to contact the Mental Health and Addictions Navigator. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Pomerow, Deputy Speaker. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to say hello to all those who are watching from District 27, Tignish Palmer Road, all those who are visiting the gallery today, especially to Sharon Cameron, our new leader. Um, I had said on Saturday, and I'll say it again today, that uh, it was 2011 when I began my political journey, and it was because of a very strong, um, intelligent uh, woman who, uh, who was able to relate to average islanders and their needs and, and was able to engage with them and had integrity. And I look forward to uh, sharing the uh, ballot, I guess, in the next coming election with a lady who has very similar similar qualities as uh, that last one. So I just want to welcome her into the gallery and say how proud I am to to go into 2023 with her in the ballot. Thank you. Charlottetown, Winslow, Government Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's always a pleasure to rise and welcome all of my colleagues as well as everyone in the gallery and congratulations to Sharon. Um, Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to give a quick uh, congratulations going out to the Charlottetown Bulk Carrier Knights. They won the uh, AAA uh, Monctonian Tournament this past weekend uh, over and uh, as a coach of this team when they were also known as the Charlottetown Islanders, um, I do want to say congratulations to a good friend of mine, Luke Beck, for uh, bringing home the title and bringing it back to PEI. So just congratulations to all of the Charlottetown Ball Carrier Knights. 
Charlottetown West Water Day, third party house leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Watching from District 14 and uh, say hello to uh, uh, our new leader too as well, Sharon Cameron. And um, you know, it was interesting because I had the I had the uh, opportunity to introduce Sharon, and, and the last the last orders that our, our leader gave me was I was not allowed to dance. So so if I do remember that, so I, I didn't dance, but Sharon really brought the energy that day. So um, <laughs> anyway, um, Mr. Speaker, I want to just send a special. Um, Thank you to a constituent, Vince Adams, who on the weekend, um, you know, did 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 something special on the Hillsborough Bridge, where he he, um, he he's done a campaign regarding walking around with a cross, and it symbolized the the weight that families carry about uh, suicide and other difficult topics to talk about. So he brought his cross to the Hillsborough Bridge to bring awareness to the to um, to what families are going through. And I was able to join him there on that cold day. And I just want to thank him for all the work that he's done. So that was pretty, pretty powerful and something I'll never forget. So thank you, Vince. Thank you. O'Leary Inverness, third party wet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, too, want to welcome all those who are watching back in the ride for O'Leary Inverness. And I want to acknowledge a couple of people in the gallery there. Uh, Gary Watts, a good uh, Toronto Maple Leaf fan. And I might remind him that the Toronto Maple Leafs blew it last night again. <laughs> but he's, he'd be used to that. And also to remind him, Speaker, as uh, the Boston Bruins are now still top team in the NHL after uh, 19 games in and looking still pretty good. Took down uh, uh, two-time Stanley Cup champs a couple of years back uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning. Also Daniel Larder, I uh, want to welcome him to the gallery. And I too also want to congratulate Sharon Cameron in the gallery here today uh, and, and certainly congratulate her on her accomplishment at uh, the East Wilshire School uh, on the weekend. We certainly know uh, all the challenges that come with a political calling and many of us here have uh, been bitten by that particular bug and uh, we all know that it's, it can have its days and moments but uh, I certainly admire her willingness uh, to take on such a difficult challenge and when Islanders do get to know her, they will like what they hear and see. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Well, I'll, be, I'll be very quick. Uh, I feel like everybody wanted to get up today and wish everybody a good week. I'd also like to congratulate uh, Sean Cameron. I want to recognize uh, a guest in the, in the gallery, Mr. Speaker, Cecil McLaughlin, uh, constituent in District 8, Stand Up Marshal. Thank you. And finally, the Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities has been waving his arms in the air for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, just take a minute to welcome everybody in District 19. But I want to say hello to Sharon. Uh, Sharon and I actually go back a long ways. Uh, when I first came to Borden back 30-some years ago, uh, I was a young police officer, and, and Sharon was a guidance counselor there at, uh, at Borden School. I know I never gave her a ticket. Um, <laughs> But on a sad note there, just right quick, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a real good friend of mine has passed away this morning, um, uh, Donna Bernard. Uh, she's been a staple of our community in Borden Carlton for long, as I've never known her. She was a, a big supporter of the Legion. Uh, any community event that everyone on, she was always at the arena doing something around the hockey and stuff like that and providing supports for other families. So uh, my heart hold, I just big, sincere, I'm sorry for the Bernard family. I just, it's, it's, it's too bad. It's a great loss. Thank you. Definitely didn't miss anyone. <laughs> member statement. The Honourable Member from Summerside South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Those of us who know that reforming our democratic institutions is essential to a more functional and effective government are continually disappointed by the insincerity of those who profess to support it when it's politically advantageous to do so and fail to do anything when the power to change it comes to their hands. The previous Premier voted against honouring the vote of the people in a plebiscite that was handily, and was handily voted out. The current Premier has indicated he has no intention of honouring the vote of this very Assembly, even though it aligns with his publicly expressed views. <coughs> Mind you, that was before he was elected. It's an election year coming up, and the electorate will be judging you based on your actions and not your promises. Promises of this administration have been shown time and time again to amount to nothing more than delays when it's time for action. That's one thing we can count on. Delayed democratic reform, delayed public housing builds, delayed financial assistance for struggling islanders, delayed carbon rebates, and the list goes on. 
If we ever are to succeed at tackling the big problems we face, we need a system of governments that does not play into the four-year election cycles, where policy decisions of the politicians who are elected are based on overthrowing the policy decisions of those who came before. We need to plot a course that is in the public's best interest and stick to it, modifying as ne made necessary by reality and not political populism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, there are so many cool things happening in Summerside this Christmas, and I wanted to bring your attention to just one of them. Downtown Summerside is hosting the first annual Yuletide Village, which is going to be an awesome family-friendly event taking place over three weekends. It'll kick off after the Santa Claus Parade on the 2nd, with Santa and Mrs. Claus visiting the village to help the city light its Christmas tree, and then it will be held on the next three Saturdays. Veterans Memorial Square is going to be transformed into a Yuletide Village on December 2nd, 3rd, 10th, and 17th. There's going to be a lot going on, like a hot chocolate bar and s'more making kits, with proceeds going to Lifehouse and the Salvation Army, cozy campfires, wagon rides, Christmas sing-alongs, a scavenger hunt, visit from Santa Claus, and so much more. And there will even be a place that you can drop off your letter to send to the North Pole, Mr. Speaker. There will be a winter craft fair on the 10th to pick up beautiful gifts for the holidays. It's going to be a fantastic addition to the downtown area, and I'm sure the whole community is going to love it. Tyne Valley Sherbrooke and, and I are already signed up to volunteer, so we hope to see you there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know once you started, I was getting an invitation. Yes, I can <laughs> Charlottetown, Winslow, and uh, Government Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, November is CPR month. On average, every 15 minutes, someone in Canada suffers a cardiac arrest at home, at school, in the workplace, at a shopping centre, a sports arena, or any other public outing. There's always the possibility that we may be a witness to a cardiac arrest of a stranger, a friend, a family member, or even a co-worker. It's imperative that Islanders are able to recognize when someone is in cardiac arrest and make action by calling 911 and performing hands-only CPR, as well as applying an AED. Many of us say that we would help, but when the situation arises, some are reluctant. We doubt our ability to do CPR in fear of hurting the person, or maybe we are uncomfortable doing CPR on a woman or a child. Performing CPR and using an AED doubles the person's chance for survival. CPR is the only way to ensure that the blood, which carries oxygen and other important nutrients, continues to flow to the person's heart, brain, and other vital organs until an AED can be found and used to shock the heart into beating again. Education and awareness can help Islanders recognize the signs of a cardiac arrest and empower them to call 911, perform that hands-only CPR, and also use an AED. So let's add our voice to Heart and Stroke and CPR Month and amplify this message further. Learn CPR, CPR rather, and how to use an AED. Uh, PEI Heart and Stroke Foundation is focusing their efforts on areas where they make the biggest impact, which includes fighting for prevention, saving lives, transforming recovery, and investing in life-saving research. Heart and Stroke Foundation of PEI offers a CPR and an AED learning session. And Mr. Speaker, if you'd like more information, you can reach out to the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Prince Edward Island by calling them at 902-892-7441. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of statement. statements. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. No? For a first question, I'll call on the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I was recently approached by a daycare operator in Surrey who, after over 30 years of providing childcare services in their community, is faced with the prospect of having to close. A question to the Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning. Do we currently have enough daycare spaces in Eastern Kings and therefore we're not going to miss the 32 spaces that the closure of this centre would represent? Uh, Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you um, for raising the question. I, uh, I'm aware of the centre that is con that is closing. Mr. Speaker, I know that the department has been working uh, with the families that are currently attending the centre to find alternative arrangements, Mr. Speaker. And uh, certainly within the community, anyone who's willing and wants to potentially take over that centre or start a family home centre in that area, we'd be happy to work with them. There's a number of different grants that we've been rolling out and we've been doing information set, uh, sessions around this and Mr. Speaker, the team is on board. I know the federal government's been very supportive and we are excited to continue growing the system. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
Now the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the response from the Minister. And um, I think she started off by saying she's aware of the centre which is closing. And of course, it doesn't have to close. This is an unwanted closure. Mm -hmm. And they're only doing that because they've been unable to attract a buyer for the business. Um, the upfront costs and the difficulty in attracting staff, particularly the latter, those, are, those have been identified as barriers to the transition to a potential new operator. Uh, the Minister spoke of grants and federal programs, and I'm wondering to the same Minister, what help is your department going to provide to ensure that these spaces are not lost and to support a prospective new owner in taking over this critical business? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I had suggested, so this um, this centre is not currently a, an early learning centre, so this would be deemed a, a family home centre per se. And so there are a number of different grants grants available. The the capital grants um, to support renovations or purchase equipment, twenty five thousand dollars. Operational grants to support quality, decrease apparent till fees of fifteen thousand. Licensing incentive grants, Mr. Speaker. Professional support, quality programming, programming, Mr. Speaker. And certainly. I hope the member across recognizes the advocacy that I have had with our federal counterparts as well. I know that the federal government is um, considering rolling out a infrastructure fund, and that's something that I've certainly pressed. I was recently there about a month ago, and I spoke with the, the federal minister, and I highlighted the importance of getting this investment, this this fund, up and running as soon as possible because this is certainly an area of concern, and we want to make sure that we're there to address it. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Now the leader of the official opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I, I am somewhat aware of the federal program that the minister just referred to, but that's something in the future. We don't know the details, but you probably know more than I do. But and when it comes to early years centres, that ability to be able to finance something which is as heavily regulated as childcare centres is really, really critical. So I look forward to seeing that program. Many of the parents of the children at the daycare centre in Surrey work in critical fields like healthcare. Some have experienced concerns about being able to continue working in their jobs as registered care workers, as nurse practitioners and as doctors if this centre actually closes. A question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Are you concerned about the impact a potential closure such as this would have on the ability of your department to continue providing quality health care in the Surrey area? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, the closure of, uh, of any daycare at any location across the province, Mr. Speaker, and the potential impact that it has, whether it's in the healthcare system, the education system, or private business, or any other industry, Mr. Speaker, is certainly a concern. And I uh, look forward uh, to working with my counterparts here, certainly uh, the Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, to come up with solutions, not only with regard to Surrey, but expansion right across the province. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. The Minister, of course, is absolutely right that having daycare spaces available to all, uh, all parents, all families who want them, is critical for our communities, for our economy, and for the well-being of families and children all across our province. And finding good daycare spaces close to home is absolutely critical. And in my own area, on the South Shore, a large and popular daycare, Mary Poppins, is having to close its infant program at the end of this week. Mm, they are licensed for 12 infants, but they've never been able to reach that full complement because they simply cannot staff it. They also have 85 children on their waiting list for their early year centre. But again, due to staffing constraints, they have never, ever operated at their full capacity. A question to the Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning. What is your department doing to ensure that this daycare Mary Poppins does not end up in the same situation as the one in Surrey, leaving dozens and dozens of families in the lurch. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do uh, really commend uh, the Leader of the Opposition for bringing these questions forward. I do want to state uh, on the record, PEI is leading the way in childcare on, uh, in, in the country, Mr. Speaker, and that's something that we hear loud and clear across the board, Mr. Speaker. So although there are some areas whereby, yes, we're, we're trying to make improvements, Mr. Speaker, over the last year and a half, we've increased spaces by 443. Um, that's significant. And Mr. Speaker, that's because we are investing in our staff. 
We're investing in our parents. We're reducing fees. We're, we're, we're rolling out a retirement uh, pension plan, Mr. Speaker. We've got all kinds of grants to help support staffing, Mr. Speaker. So although, again, I do appreciate the, the, the leader of the opposition raising these concerns, we are there to support our families and our centres, and we will continue to be in the months ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the official opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. So when the minister says we're leading the country, I'd like her to go and tell that to the families who are all unable to find spaces for their kids. Maybe we're leading in the percentage of unfilled spaces in our daycare centres. That's something I could believe that we are actually leading in. The difficulty in hiring good staff is partly a result of the inflexibility of the Child Care Services Board when it comes to recognising credentials. And not having enough staff, as I've already stated this afternoon, is one of the critical, re critical reasons why we do not have all of the spaces in our daycares filled. At Mary Poppins, for example, there's a staff member who has a master's degree in special needs and six years of experience. But because their degree doesn't conform with the requirements of the pay grid, they only qualify for minimum wage. Wow. Oh. Six years and a master's degree minimum wage. A question to the same minister. These workers are highly trained and experienced. What are you going to do to make sure that they can be paid appropriately so that daycare centers can actually provide all of the spaces that they are licensed to offer. Honourable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning. Thank you very much, and uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and with regards to this specific case, I'll take that back to the department, and, and we will work with the staff member and, and the centre to, to find some positive um, way forward, Mr. Speaker. And, and certainly, this is this is something that is extremely important to the department. We're working with our post-secondary institutions, Holland College, Collège de Lille, Mr. Speaker. We they, Holland College has introduced the accelerated program. Collège de Lille is doing the same. We've worked with the ECDA to. Incorporate Incorporate the Steps to Success program, Mr. Speaker. So again, I recognize the importance of the, the concerns that are being raised, but we are working to address some of these and uh, look forward to further discussions with the honourable member. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Jeremy Straffer. Mr. Speaker, healthcare workers have been holding this healthcare system together long before COVID. My caucus colleagues and I have been pushing this government to address systemic issues in healthcare. Um, and this government comes up with ideas that hmm, no other politician maybe came up with, like we'll throw money at them, but only at some of them, because you know some will get more than others, and some are more valuable than others. This minister has yet to explain the logic around the retention initiative that was announced last month, so let's hear it. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. What formula did you use to determine who would get the different levels of cash retention incentives, or just no incentive at all? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate uh, uh, the question from the Honourable Member. And in her preamble, she references the importance and how health care workers do hold the system together. She is absolutely right on that, Mr. Speaker. With regard to the retention incentives that have been announced, to this point in time, it covered RCWs, it covered LPNs, paramedics, RNs, and nurse practitioners. That segment of the front line that are there day in and day out, not saying that they are any more or any less important, but we have major shortages in those areas, Mr. Speaker, and we needed to provide uh, incentives, retention incentives, to keep them there in our system on the island and also, Mr. Speaker, to encourage ones that are near retirement or recently retired to re-enter and stay in the health care system. Thank you. Mermaid Straffer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So psychologists were also deliberately excluded from the retention bonus. I met with the minister regarding uh, mental health services. When I asked about the wait list for counselling services, I was told that the wait list was only for one-on-one -on -one counselling services. So question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Do we have a wait list for mental health counselling because we have a policy decision to not hire enough psychologists or because we have a retention issue and cannot retain them? Very much, Mr. Speaker, and with regard to psychologists, Mr. Speaker, our government has increased the number of psychologists in the province. Uh, there has been great success in the recruitment of psychologists, Mr. Speaker, and our government is a government that actually put in place 
uh, recruitment incentive of $15,000 per psychologist. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mermaid Streffer. Mr. Speaker. A paramedic, a registered nurse, and a social worker work as a team on the mobile mental health unit. They all work together, and their skill set should be equally valued. The minister uses all the right words to say how valued they are and how respected they are. But last month, those same teams walked into a press conference, and the paramedic and the registered nurse were shown how valued they are, albeit not equally, and the social worker was told to wait outside because when it really comes down to it, the government's motto is, it's about some people. To the same minister, how do you justify that? As I've said, and thank you, Mr. Speaker, and as I've said previously, Mr. Speaker, that all of our health care workers play a pivotal role. Uh, the retention incentives that were announced uh, here uh, uh, three, four weeks ago, thereabouts, Mr. Speaker, I already alluded to the rationale for that first wave, if you like, of retention incentives. incentives. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to have discussions, to work with uh, our unions with regard to the potential of other incentives. Mermaid Streffer. Mr. Speaker, senior leadership at Health PEI shared that Health PEI was asked by this government to cut $2 million from their proposed operating budget, which meant that some retention initiatives were, f were actually cut. Government spent a measly $50,000 on retention efforts for almost 7,000 employees. Wow. This equates to less than $10 each. Remember, this is the only retention bonus that many of them have gotten so far. So question to the minister. Do you agree that some of our frontline health care workers only deserve a $10 thank you? Wow. The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think uh, the, the Honorable Member uh, alludes to, uh, if I recall, if I heard it correctly, budget cut. Mr. Speaker, our government has increased funding for health care in this great province of ours by 200 million since coming to power. To me, Mr. Speaker, that's not in any way, shape, or form any type of a cut. Thank you. It's really convenient when the pre-budget consultation numbers that come out from the departments are actually not shared publicly because then the government has to doesn't actually have to admit to anything. So on this side of the house, we believe that all frontline health care workers are important. Let's say the Premier invites the mobile mental health team to come into the legislature. An RN, a paramedic and a social worker walk into the legislature. The Premier says to the RN, you're a health care hero, here's $3,500. He then says to the paramedic, you're a health care hero, here's $2,500. Then the Premier turns to the social worker and says, you're a health hero, here's a tiny flashlight. <laughs> Not very funny, actually. Like so to the Premier, I get, different, I get the different recruitment amounts based on education, but how do you justify belittling our health care frontline workers by valuing the work they've done differently or, for some, not valuing it at all? The Honourable Premier. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I believe the Minister was doing a great job of actually explaining the process, Mr. Speaker, and responding to the requests from uh, the head of the nurses union, for example, to try to put in, in place a, recent, a retention uh, incentive uh, to keep those individuals that are in the system here a little bit longer, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we made the first initial stages with the uh, RCWs, with the paramedics, with the RNs, with the nurse practitioners, Mr. Speaker, and as the minister said, we'll continue to look at that. Anything we can do uh, to uh, uh, solidify the services of the professionals who look after after us every day, Mr. Speaker, we'll try to do, and uh, that's what our process will be heading forward. Summerside Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, UPEI promised that people would be released from their NDAs in order to allow for a proper investigation into how sexual harassment complaints were handled. And so far, they've followed through on that. But yesterday, we learned that the person who is accused of harassing those people is also a signatory to the NDAs and is refusing to allow them to participate. A question to the Minister of Justice. Do you feel that silencing some of the people who were most severely impacted is going to have a negative impact? impact on the investigation at UPEI. Honorable Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member, uh, you, you brought uh, a bill to the floor, a very important bill, and uh, I know that uh, UPEI is in the throes of, of dealing with the situation they've got, and I, I do not support uh, 
I do not support that. I, I feel it's that they, they should be, but it's 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 not up to me. It's up to it's up to you, PEI. Mr. Speaker, this is such a great example of why NDAs are a problem. We know that there were concerns about how sexual misconduct complaints were handled at the university, and now as they're trying to address the root of that problem, there's information that the investigation is just not going to hear about. Recommendations can only be made based on what the investigators hear. It's pretty clear that the public loses when abusers are allowed to silence their targets to the same minister. What are you doing to ensure these important voices are free to be heard during the review? Honorable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member, that would be something uh, that we would have a conversation with UPI about, but it's through UPI that we'll be dealing with, with the NDAs and the, whether they have them or not. Summerside Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, have I got a surprise for you. <laughs> when I drafted the legislation on the NDA Act, I included a section that spells out a list of exemptions that are true even for old NDAs. And the last one on that list is a person or class of persons as prescribed in the regulations. So actually, you have the power to change it so that workplace investigations are exempt and these voices are free to be heard and these people can be empowered like UPEI is saying they want in the first place. <laughs> To the same minister, will you immediately add workplace investigations as a class of persons that people are free to talk to about their NDAs, or will you side with their abuser? Great. Honorable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Honorable Member. Uh, we're willing to work with uh, through the department. I'll talk to my deputy to see what, what can be done, and I'll bring that back to you. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this year, in the spring sitting, this House passed Motion 96, urging government to recognize long COVID. Long COVID isn't mysterious, it isn't benign, and it is not a figment of anyone's imagination. The post-viral syndrome called long COVID is real, and it is a serious health and social issue. But since we debated that motion in the House, we've heard nothing from public health or this government. Question for the Minister of Health. In March, you committed to working with your colleagues from across the country to rapidly understand long COVID and bring best practices back to PEI. It's more than six months later. So what do you have to report? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as the Honorable Member would know, uh, you will get a record of great work that has done, been done by ones in uh, uh, CPHO. Dr. Morrison, uh, I have complete faith, Mr. Uh, Speaker. I do not have a finger uh, on them every day asking, okay, what are you doing today? I have great faith that they are and will continue to provide the best guidance, the best advice to Islanders and to work with their counterparts right across the country in doing this, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ongoing research shows that up to one in five with COVID develop longer term symptoms regardless of the severity of their original infection. In the UK, the NHS has established over 60 specialty clinics in, starting in 2020 to offer diagnosis and support for patients suffering with the ongoing and complex health issues as a result of COVID. Without this targeted support, sufferers risk being misdiagnosed or not treated at all for what can be debilitating symptoms including chronic fatigue, heart disease, diabetes and kidney failure. Question for the Minister of Health. Motion 96 called for a dedicated long COVID clinic to diagnose, treat and support those experiencing longer term symptoms. What have you done to make this a priority? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I do uh, want to thank the Honourable Member for this line of questioning. It is extremely important. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what I will do is go back to the Department, go back to CPHO, bring back information with regard to the discussions that have taken place and that will be taking place and that are ongoing, and uh, make that available to my colleagues here in the Legislature. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. O'Leary and Vernas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today we hear the announcement from the federal government that they will be implementing the federal backstop carbon pricing plan in Prince Edward Island on July 2023. Mr. Speaker, this is another example to add to the ever-growing list of failures by this government. They have, they have lost their ability to distribute and reinvest in their own provincial carbon tax revenue and create programs and initiatives that are responsible for both 
an ever-changing environment for Islanders who this tax will affect the most. Question to the Premier. Was there a part of your plan that the federal government did not uh, accept or that you didn't qualify for, or did they lose confidence in your ability to transfer funds to Islanders? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I've told this legislature many times, uh, we have tried in good faith to negotiate with the federal government to uh, reach uh, an agreement that Islanders and Canadians uh, can live with. Um, we have had a carbon pricing system in place since 2015, I believe, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've had been able to, through two successful negotiations, been able to negotiate uh, some exemptions, Mr. Speaker, to help uh, make life a little bit easier for the consumers in PEI at a time when they don't have any other alternatives uh, for uh, for uh, alternative sources other than those fossil fuel uh, uh, carbon emitting uh, sources, Mr. Speaker. So in our deliberations with the federal government this time, we were hoping to maintain an exemption for home heating fuel. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and also the little bit that we have negotiated for, tax, uh, for uh, gas and diesel, uh, and uh, uh, knowing very well that they were going to implement uh, a price on propane for the first time. And uh, uh, we were surprised to turn on the radio this morning and hear that uh, a decision was made, Mr. Speaker. And uh, so I guess, yes, uh, uh, we tried to keep home heating fuel 17.4 cents cheaper. We tried to keep gas 3.4 cents cheaper. We tried to keep propane 10 cents cheaper, and we tried to keep diesel 4 cents cheaper, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I guess in your mind, if that's a failure, Mr. Speaker, then we failed. Larry <coughs> for us. I'd add, Mr. Speaker, that just in the increases of some of the fuel prices in recent weeks, the province would take in an extra two cents a liter just on a 20 cent liter increase, Mr. Speaker. So they've taken in money. The Premier stated last week that they were negotiating a plan for the carbon levy eligibility, but we hear they submitted their plan in the final hour, Mr. Speaker, after co signing a letter asking for an extension the day before the deadline. Question to the Premier. Did PEI submit a plan that they knew would be rejected, just like Nova Scotia did, or so we can turn and um, blame the federal government after having its hand out for wanting more funds from the federal government? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, we've been negotiating with the federal government for months and months, Mr. Speaker, and I'm not being critical of the federal government, Mr. Speaker. We're, as islanders, we're supportive of carbon reduction, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we used to be ninth worst in the provincial uh, Canadian provinces in terms of emissions. Now we're fourth, Mr. Speaker. So I think that speaks for itself. We've been trying to utilize the funds to invest in islanders and to incentivize them to actually reduce their carbon footprint, Mr. Speaker, which all islanders seem to be very interested in doing, Mr. Speaker. And that's what we were continuing uh, to try to negotiate with, Mr. Speaker. And as I say, uh, you know, we've reached fourth from ninth with having some exemptions in place, Mr. Speaker. Islanders want to get to a better, cleaner future, Mr. Speaker. We think there's a way to do that without adding to the cost, uh, Mr. Speaker, at the pump. But I guess uh, the leader or the, uh, the, the member from uh, O'Leary Inverness uh, thinks the price of fuel should be 17 four, four cents higher for those buying home heating fuel in this district, Mr. Speaker. I'd be interested to see what the people in, in O'Leary Inverness think of that, Mr. Speaker. Second supplementary. Ahead, Mr. Speaker, the, the government is still taking in lots of revenue and other forms of taxation through our fuel system. They can you could easily negotiate something better. Last week, the Premier was bragging about his plan was the envy of other provinces. But today, we now hear it didn't work out, Mr. Speaker. Will your government continue to be offering programs for heat pumps, electric hot water heaters, Tony Transit, if you don't have the federal monies to distribute? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, pretty ironic since it's his party that's taken it away from us that he'd be asking these questions, Mr. Speaker, but uh, I guess I'd say to the new leader who's here for the first time, good luck. This is what you're dealing with. <laughs> this is what you're dealing with. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so, Mr. Speaker, not only are we the envy of every other province, not only has every other minister called this minister and asked, tell me about what you've done, Mr. Speaker, the federal government themselves, Mr. Speaker, stole our heat pump program and announced it yesterday. So this is what the federal government did. They said, guess what we're going to do for you, PEI? We're going to give you a heat pump program for people under $55,000. And we said, well, isn't that great? We did that two years ago, Mr. Speaker, but thank you very much. Charlotte 
Westroyalty. Because they're trying to the pipes. Because they're pumping this and off the road. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> The inability to negotiate a made in Prince Edward Island approach to carbon pricing is going to have noticeable effects across many individuals and sectors across the province. It's clear to see why the Premier was so upset about being questioned about this in question period last week. He must have known this was coming. We all knew that to continue to make measure, we, ha we all have to make measures to, to control carbon. The federal backstop is not the only answer to the province climate response, and as the Green Party would make you think that. The Liberal plan, we had provided, provided balanced vision and something government lacks. Question to the Premier, how are we going to support and protect the people the price of carbon will affect the most, our working poor, which, which is growing under your watch? if we no longer have full control of our revenue distribution. Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is what I hear from the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Put up the price 17.4 cents for furnace oil. Put on 10 cents for propane. Put another 3.4 cents on gas, Mr. Speaker, and put another 4 cents on diesel. Oh, and by the way, what are you going to do to help people that have to pay more, Mr. Speaker? Well, that's exactly what we've been trying to negotiate, is to try not to make them pay any more than they need to at a time when inflation's at the highest level in a century, Mr. Speaker, when the volatility in the gas market and the oil market in the world is just going just berserk, Mr. Speaker, and causing so much challenge for those. What have we done? Tooney Transit, Active Transportation, EV rebates, free hot water heaters, free uh, heat pumps, Mr. Speaker, solar. I got a bigger list over here, Mr. Speaker. I can go on and on and on, Mr. Speaker. Will we continue to help, Mr. Speaker? We're certainly going to help. We're asking the federal government, could you help us just a little bit, Mr. Speaker, because we're there. Charlottetown, West Riding. You, you blame everybody else sometimes for different things. I'm talking to you, Mr. Premier. Islanders need to know this. So um, before, be, before you start going on about I don't know what, answer the questions. We saw another announcement from the federal government yesterday regarding $5,000 grant for heat pump installations for low-income families. But again, we neglected individuals who rent and need to be the primary, primary owners of that residence. This is an important question because this is coming to me. Question to the Premier. Will you modify your not-so-free heat pump program to include tenants? And will you use your government's inflation profits to do so? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, my fa late father would say, if the man's gall fell out, you need the shipyard crane to lift it, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> and you know what? I got to agree with him, Mr. Speaker. Can you imagine? The audacity to ask this question. We've been fighting, Mr. Speaker, with the federal government for two years not to put the costs up, Mr. Speaker. We've been doing, taking the money, Mr. Speaker, from the carbon tax that the federal government has put in place, and we've been investing in Islanders, Mr. Speaker, thousands and thousands of heat pumps, Mr. Speaker, for free. What he did yesterday, the minister, God love him, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Wilkinson, a great minister, a great guy. I told him about the idea when we were in Stephenville, Mr. Speaker, and I'm glad he was listening, but guess what? We've already done it. You're throwing money and we can't give them heat pumps. They already have one, Mr. Speaker. So can you give us some money so we can help the next people who need them, Mr. Speaker? 56% of Islanders heat their house with home heating fuel, Mr. Speaker. And his government in Ottawa put it up 17.4 cents today, and he's mad at me. <laughs> score and seven years ago there was a premier who was good at storytelling and that was a pretty good one right there <laughs> mr speaker revenues have been carried out to support ev and heat pumps but we see that the, this the the minister wasn't even able to spend all that money uh, question to the premier why has the federal government re rejected your plan and what happens now for islanders to take advantage of rebates in order to afford transitioning to cleaner energy something we want to do where will those funds uh, go and will the province incentives be cut? 
the Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, this is the question we've been asking the Federal Minister of the Environment for six months, Mr. Speaker. What are we going to do when we have to displace the funds, Mr. Speaker? We're not sure. But I tell you what, it seems Minister Wilkinson seems to be interested to work with us, Mr. Speaker, even though they're going to try. They want to pay for all the heat pumps that we've already installed, Mr. Speaker. But listen, he's got some money there that he wants to help. He's a good man. He's genuinely interested in trying to help. So we're going to meet with him, the Minister and I, and chat to him and see if there's a way that we can take the program we have and expand it. But I'll tell you what, Mr. Speaker, from day one, from day one, Mr. Speaker, when the former government wanted to give people licenses, driver's licenses and registrations, Mr. Speaker, we said, I don't think that's going to do much to save the environment, Mr. Speaker. So we changed that faulty program. We've invested in heat pumps. We've invested in EV rebates, Tony Transit, active transportation, solar, hot water heaters, insulation, Mr. Speaker. It goes on and on again. We collected $32 million from the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, and last year we spent 70, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, three, three weeks ago I stood in this House and talked about the significant shoreline debris on the North Shore as a result of Hurricane Fiona and the need to clean it up as soon as possible. Um, the minister responsible said that surveying was underway, a crew was in place, areas were being identified, and the program details were being finalized. However, Mr. Speaker, I'm getting reports uh, from my constituents that places like New London Bay and Rustico Bay, um, other than the amazing efforts of our fishers, cleanup has not even started. So a question to the Minister of Fisheries and Communities, what is the status of shoreline cleanup efforts across the province, especially on the North Shore? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, cleanup has started. We have crews out there on the ground. We have contractors that are on, 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 on call. On call. The contractors are, are identifying the areas. They have identified the areas, and they're working along to get each area taken care of as they're prioritized. There was supposed to be actually an airplane go up yesterday and do a further in-depth survey. However, it was grounded due to the winds. The work is ongoing, I'll remember. Rusty call in, Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's great. I'm glad he's doing more surveys, getting planes in the air, but we need action on the ground, on the North Shore, and we're not seeing it. Mr. Speaker. So the, uh, the PEI Coastal Property Guide released in 2016 and the new PEI Climate Adaptation Plan both offer advice to property owners regarding shoreline protection. Uh, with regards to helping repair damage to uninsured property, the former tells property owners you shouldn't count on it. However, it also acknowledges that most island beaches are public property and the new climate ad adaptation plan states it does not recommend as a first alternative the use of shoreline stabilization along the ice perimeter coastline. So it's my understanding that there is funding set aside for shoreline property damage. A question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Change. How much funding is available to restore and protect our public beaches and what can it be used for? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think with our climate adaptation strategy, what we're trying to do is look forward and say what are the things that we can do as, as we move forward and what should be allowed along, along the shoreline. And, and uh, the member from Moraldona and I had this uh, debate question period here last week where I said, you know, maybe in some cases you won't be allowed to build as close as, as you did before. Uh, as far as what money is uh, available, at this point there's no money available from my department to do shoreline restoration. What we're looking at is whether or not there should be, and if it does, should it be natural, how it should be, be uh, done in the future, and where it should be done in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Colombo, your second supplementary. So, Mr. Speaker, what I'm hearing is, is, a, is a lot of talk about climate change ad adaptation, yes. but we actually need action to happen on the shorelines to protect our shorelines. We've got private owners that are adjacent to the public beaches. Their land has been devastated in Fiona. They're worried about storm surges <laughs> this winter. Another question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and, and Climate Change. Um, what are you going to do to help protect our private, private be public beaches and the private lands that are adjacent to them? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's common knowledge in the climate uh, change file that beaches will be lost or forever changed. We saw that in the North Shore under Fiona that uh, some of the beaches were devastated and they may never come back or they may never at least come back in our lifetime. Who really knows? 
Uh, as far as, w as the people who have built along uh, the shoreline, as I said to the leader of the opposition here last week, the, the recommendation has always been in some of those areas not, not to build there. So uh, obviously there's people who, who ignored us. And I think it's one of the, the big, single biggest risks we have in, in climate change in the world is that people have built in places that they shouldn't have either in, in floodplains in major cities that turned into huge developments that will become floodplains again. And here in Prince Edward Island along our coastal uh, shoreline where, where it has been long re recognized that the, the shoreline will change, the floodplains will grow, and maybe you, you shouldn't necessarily build in that spot. <laughs> So long, long answer short, we're, our, our plans are going to be to put definitive action on paper to say here's what you can do, here's what you can't do, because people aren't listening. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Rusty Cole Emerald. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is no time to give up, Minister. You're the Minister of Action. We expect, expect things to happen. And Mr. Speaker, action number 22 of the new climate adaptation plan includes, I quote, develop a program to support nature-based solutions to erosion and flooding for lower-income individuals. Question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Change. Is it your position that shoreline armor, armoring should no longer be allowed? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank, Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure if that's my position. I think what my, my position is is that we need to get the expert advice, whether it's from both our own department, the Climate Adaptation School at UPEI, and whatever other experts we have uh, around shoreline protection on Prince Edward Island, come up with a policy that's a suitable policy. Um, what I said last week was that we, we protect our own assets with arm, armor stone, so it would be a, a little bit rich for us to say, hey, we, we're going to protect the Hillsborough Bridge like this, but you can't protect. Uh, so I think we have to have the plan that's right. But I think anybody in, in my position would say, where possible, protecting with a natural barrier is is much better. And I think the, the Stratford Watershed Group had a, a living shoreline that they've, they've worked on that was quite successful over there. And I think we have a lot of uh, lessons to draw from what they've done and what might work in other parts of Prince Charles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Rester Cole So, Mr. Speaker, your action plan says you're doing living shorelines. You're saying you are supporting shoreline. Uh, armoring. I'm a little confused, uh, but let me ask you another question. In the wake of Hurricane Fiona, property, um, many property owners are acting now, they're acting right now, Mr. Speaker, to protect their shoreline with the goal of protection from further erosion of weakened shores from winter storm surges. And another issue that I've been hearing of, and it's been alluded to in this house before, is some landowners uh, may, may become even more vulnerable because their neighbors have the financial resources to use shoreline armoring for their property, which may cause even more damage to their neighbors in a future weather event. A question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Change. What legislation and regulations exist to prevent shoreline armoring in one spot that negatively impacts neighboring properties? Double Minister of Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So there, there's nothing that, that would protect the, the adjacent shore, shoreline. I think it's the, it's the crux, it's part of the crux of the Point Rush argument is that if you look at the pictures post Fiona, it's really accelerated the, the, uh, the erosion next to it. And that's what armoring will do in places that have it that the, the neighbors don't. So we, it's a policy that we have to get right. So this is the policy that I talked about last week that we have to determine what happens if only one person wants to do it and the others can't afford to do it. What happens, it, should we allow it at all? Should we force people to pull back? Like what are we gonna do to, to best protect Prince Edward Island from climate change? And, and I don't know the answer, but we, because I'm not the expert in it, but I, unlike the Liberal government, when you were here, I'm going to rely on experts. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, and, and Mr. Speaker, my, my constituents are, are looking for solutions. They want to do the right thing, whether they're seasonal residents, cottage owners, or live right there year-round. And last week, the Trout River Environmental Committee, the TREC, uh, it's a watershed group, in conjunction with the Stanley Bridge Sterling Women's Institute, they held a really great meeting uh, on coastal erosion and Fiona. The Climate Lab was there, did a great presentation. Over 50 people attended to hear excellent, excellent information but most seem to leave with more questions than answers. Answers I think the province can provide regarding climate change adaptation, especially with respect to shoreline restoration and protection. So question, question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Change. I want to work together with you. I want to educate the people in my district. I want to make progress. Will you commit to holding an information session and workshop on the North Shore as soon as possible, led by the climate change experts from your department? The Honourable Minister of Environment. 
Yeah. yeah, Mr. Speaker, I think that's a great idea. So, yeah, I will commit to that. I will co commit to sending the, our experts out to meet with the people that are concerned in your community. I think it's great that so many people would show, would, would show up to a meeting that were so concerned and want to do, do uh, something to make PEI better. More, as a matter of fact, than showed up at the Liberal leadership this weekend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. A question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Just in general, why do we have inspections and why are they important? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, uh, the Honourable Member, it's a very uh, broad question, certainly. Why do we have inspections and why are they important? Uh, maybe the Honourable Member could give some more specifics to that question, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. McDonald's, we McDonald's, Wendy's, or any other food establishment offer similar services. As a consumer, I would assume that they undergo similar inspection processes, which are carried out by similar inspectors. Question to the Minister. Would you agree with that? Why or why, or not? why, or why not? Health and wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, you know, I'm not uh, an expert on inspections, food inspections, or any other type of inspections, but I am a consumer, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Speaker, though, if the Honourable Member, and I do uh, appreciate, uh, I think, where the Honourable Member is coming from, but if the Member could provide some exact uh, uh, parameters, if you like, to the question that she is asking, I would certainly be happy to go back to the experts and get the answers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Tom, Victoria Park. Thank you. Let me get a little more specific. So right now, private long-term care and community care homes are inspected every year by independent inspectors, and they are subject to surprise inspections. They are legally required to make the changes within a designated amount of time. Meanwhile, our government-owned long long-term care homes are peer accredited. Once every six months, they know it's coming. This boils down very simply. Private is held accountable. Government is not. Question to the minister. Why do public care homes have much looser inspection requirements than private homes? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm glad that at last we've got to the crux of the question of the issue here after four questions, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, she is absolutely right that private long-term care homes are inspected by an independent board. Mr. Speaker, as well, though, our publicly owned long-term care facilities, they go through a vigorous, as she had referenced, a vigorous accreditation process as well, Mr. Speaker. There are criteria there with regard to staffing levels, a number of other uh, things as well, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so, yes, we need to have those inspections at the private long-term care homes, Mr. Speaker, but also certainly through the accreditation <coughs> process. Thank you. Charles Down, Victoria Park, final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to correct myself. It's not six every six months, it's every six years. You are only expected, inspected once every six years. So why is, is it good for, why is not, what's not go, good for the goose is not good for the gander. I didn't get that right, but you know my point. <laughs> <laughs> we found out in committee meetings that government-owned homes were meeting, quote, standard levels of care. What this apparently means is seniors are not bathed for days, eating every meal on their own, not getting taken to the washroom, etc. We're calling this standard level of care. Not in my world, we're not. Question to the minister. Seniors deserve an appropriate level of care, whether they're in private or public homes. Will you commit to inspecting public, public homes just as rigorously as you do private homes? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I absolutely agree with uh, the Honourable Member that our seniors that have provided so much to this island, provided so much to each and every one of us, deserve the very best level of care that can be provided to them. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I do appreciate the, the member bringing uh, these uh, uh, points, these comments forward, and I uh, pledge that I will go back to the department. I'm not going to give an absolute commitment right here today, Mr. Speaker, but I will go back to the department, have that discussion with departmental officials, and I would be happy then to have a meeting with the honorable members follow up on this. Thank you. End of question period. 
statements by ministers, presenting and receiving petitions, tabling of documents, no? reports by committees, no? introduction of government bills, government motions, Orders of the day, government. The Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action that the 29th order of the day be now read. Show the carry. Order 29, Residential Tenancy Act, Bill Number 87, in committee. The Honorable Deputy Premier. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action that this House do now resolve itself into committee of the whole House to take into consideration said bill. Shall I carry? The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmero, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be in Titchwald Residential Tenancy Act. Is it the pleasure? Sorry. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Sure. Our members, we left off on page 11, section 16, and it is currently under debate. Would you please state your name and position for Hansard? 
Certainly. Vernon McIntyre, Legislative Coordinator for the Department of Social Development and Housing. Thank you very much and welcome back. So, um, are there any questions on this section? Further questions? Shall I carry? Carry. Honorable members, we had put section 11 on hold. There was an amendment that was going to come to the floor. Apparently, the amendment's not coming now. So, shall section 11 carry? Carry. Carry. Let me go back. Get it. Section 17, acceleration term prohibited. Questions? Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 18, inspection at start of tenancy. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair, and welcome back, Vernon. Um, I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on what is meant by the term approved form and uh, kind of what, what inspections that will include. Sure. So an approved form would be a form um, put together by the director's office or the director. Um, it'll, so it'll be work done after the act uh, is uh, passed. <clears throat> and it would outline what has to be included in the inspection itself. Um, so that form hasn't been created yet. It will be created before the act is proclaimed. Charlotte Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And I'm just trying to get a sense of what specific issues are being raised at IRAC that we're hoping um, this addresses. But I'm wondering if you've spoken to IRAC about post-tenancy disputes as it comes to conditions of units. This section uh, wasn't brought to us by the director's office. Now, I'll be very clear, IRAC would be more of the appeal, the director's office. This, this was brought forward um, as part of the original draft and probably came from as the drafter, and, and I wasn't the original drafter, as they created the act, probably took it from another another province who had found it successful in part of their in their research. But I do think this is a, a an important piece to the act in terms of when the tenancy starts. Right now, you do not have to do an inspection. It's certainly encouraged, but you don't have to do one now. It'll have to be done. There has to be a report provided to the tenant, and that provides a piece of evidence if there is at the end of the tenancy, a dispute on, you know, the condition of the unit. Um, this report will provide a piece of that that the director can look at to say, okay, well, we've got a report here that was, that was done with the tenant and the landlord together. They both signed it to say, yes, here's what the condition of the apartment was, and now it appears to be the same or different. Charlotte, Victoria Park. Yeah, thank you for that, and I, I think that that's that's really a, a really good addition. Um, we've heard a lot of stories of, of people whose the damage in their apartments were kind of put on them and dispute on whose whose fault it was and and that sort of thing. So I'm wondering how these inspections account for reasonable wear and tear. Again, I you know to get into a specific on reasonable wear and tear, the director's office when they hear the evidence, if there is an appeal based or sorry an application based on that um, you know the director would look at the evidence and based on you know past decisions they've made they would make that decision Charlotte Thomas Victoria Park thank you chair I'm good for that section shall the section carry carry section 19 tenant shall pay rent when due Charlotte Thomas Victoria Park thank you chair <coughs> subsection 1 um, this was a, a, so a tenant shall pay rent when it is due under the tenancy agreement, whether or not the landlord complies with this act, the regulations or the tenancy agreement, unless a tenant has an express right under this act to deduct or withhold all or a portion of the rent. Um, and this was a big issue after Fiona. A lot of tenants um, who, especially those who couldn't live in their units anymore due to the destruction there, they weren't sure whether they should pay the rent or not. Um, how is the province intending to communicate the, this requirement to the public? Well, so I wouldn't be able to speak on specifics of Fiona. I haven't spoken to the director's office in terms of, in terms of that. Um, in terms of how this would be, the thought is that we don't want tenants and landlords getting into a direct confrontation. Um, we want them to work through the director's office to file an application for um, <clears throat> for a decision or for a decision from the director on how this should proceed, and that's the uh, one of the uh, you know basic concept of this act is the director's office provides that rental court. We don't want people trying to take the law into their own hands and say, you know, I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do this. Um, it's better to go to the director provide the information and let the director's office provide a decision. 
Sheriff sure, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for that. And I'm just looking at subsection two, um, where it says that a landlord shall provide a tenant with a receipt for rent paid in cash. And I'm just clarifying that in cash means physical money. Yes. Charlotte Town Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And what kind of receipt does this subsection mean? Is it a, is it a paper document, or is it like can it be sent as a simple text message? Uh, I don't think it clarifies what that is. Uh, I'd have to get back to you for more information. <coughs> Charlotte Town Victoria Park. Okay. I just have a couple more questions here on this, and then I'm good. Um, so I'm looking at Clause 4B. Um, in, in what sorts of situations would a landlord be given permission to seize a tenant's property? It wouldn't be under this act. Um, I, I don't think there's anything in this act that talks about a landlord seizing a, personal, a person's property. Um, there is the idea that if a building is, if a unit's abandoned, the landlord has the right to remove the property and put it into storage and then dispose of it based on section, I believe it's 40, and we'll get, it's quite detailed on how that works. <coughs> Excuse me. Charlotte Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And my last question, I think, um, could you provide examples of other enactments that would allow a landlord to seize the property of a tenant? I no, not not myself. Again, I'm I'm not a lawyer, and and I have never, you know, been to a court case where that would have happened. Charlotte Victoria Park. Good. Thank you, Chair. Summerside South Drive. Um, so, when it comes to things being left behind when a tenant leaves, and it, I heard you just say that the, the landlord has the right to store the property, but is it a right or an expectation of the landlord? Well, I think when we get to section, again, I believe it's 39 or 40, um, it goes through it in quite a bit of detail. Perhaps we should leave that question for that area. Okay. Summerside South Drive. Okay. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 20, prohibit fees during tenancy. Charlotte and Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, in subsection 1, a landlord, landlord cannot charge a guest fee. Um, we've heard from of some landlords who try to restrict the tenant's ability to have guests over to stay the night. Um, and we know that, that landlords can't charge an additional fee for that. Are, but are landlords it permitted to ban guests in the first place? I don't believe so, but I would have to go back to the director's office to see if there are situations where it is allowed. Charlotte sure, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair, and I would really appreciate that bring back because we've heard um, quite a few cases recently where that is the case, and and would love some, you know, some the clarity around that. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering for subsection two, can you explain how C and D are different? So C and D are different in that <clears throat> the service fee charged by the financial institution, so if the financial institution charged a service fee to the landlord of $25, um, that's the fee charged by the service, by the, by the bank itself or the financial institution. Um, the administration fee would be to pay for the landlord's staff time to reprocess uh, the payment from the tenant. And that can be up to $25 as well. Cheryl Town Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, so Clause 2E, a fee for services or facilities requested by the tenant if those services or facilities are not required to be provided under the tenancy agreement. Um, is there any requirement that the fee for providing these services or facilities be proportionate to the cost to deliver them? This is a pretty rare, I mean, again, this act is very, um, it's very long and deliberate in terms of you know, laying out things that used to be based in common law or contract law. When you look at a fee for services or facilities requested by the tenant, if those services or facilities are not required to be provided under the tenancy agreement, I mean, again, I can't think of a situation that I've heard in any of the discussions where that would come up, so I'm really not sure how that would be done in terms of, you know, I'm really not sure how that would actually apply. Sheriff Town Victoria Park. Thank you, Sheriff. So just my last question then I was going to ask about what kind of services might be included in the regulations, but it kind of There's nothing there's nothing in consideration right now. Again, that's a cover, you know, um, to cover off the situation that may come up down the road on this piece of legislation. If 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 a fee to be charged by a landlord um, was to come forward for consideration, that would allow the, the powers to make a regulation in regards to that. But there's nothing in consideration right now. So section carry? Carried. 21, terminating or restricting services or facilities. 
Charlotte on Victoria Park. One question here, um, <clears throat> in subsection two, uh, who makes a determination that the reduction in rent is equivalent to the reduction in the value of the tenancy agreement? The director would. Okay. Okay. Thank Shall you. Shall section carry? Carry. carry? Section 22. Tenants' right to quiet enjoyment. Charlotte on Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering, what does um, reasonable privacy mean? So again, that would be that would be based on the director's decision. Um, the director would have experience, uh, you know, years of experience listening and going through hearings based on, you know, disputes between landlords and tenants, and and they would they would be the person who makes a decision on whether it's reasonable privacy or not. Thank you, Chair. And would this extend to things like the creation of bad tenant lists? Uh, I wouldn't be able to say that, Member. I'd, I'd have to ask the Director if that was something that it would consider. Charlotte on Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we've heard from stakeholders and different organizations who are looking for stronger language around freedom from harassment and discrimination. Can you explain why that language isn't in here? Certainly. So. To start with, I mean, it comes down to when I draft, I get, I, you know, I receive legal opinions um, as part of the drafting process, um, and in the opinion that I received on this request, and we certainly took it too, too legal to discuss, um, that it was that this, the idea of, I believe they, you know, wish to add harassment and discrimination. Um, from what we kind of heard, that if a prospective tenant feels they've been discriminated against, that human rights would be the correct remedy. Um, and if they're being harassed, that that would fall under a re unreasonable disturbance. <clears throat> Charlotte on Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And and just on that, it, it doesn't it often doesn't make sense to send those those cases of harassment discrimination issues to the Human Rights Commission due to the long wait times and um, between the opening and closing of files. And so the Landlord and Tenant Board in Ontario has guidelines for complaints that touch on human rights. So I'm wondering, under this Act, would complaints that have a human rights element still be heard by IRAC? I would have to go back and ask them. My understanding is the, that this section is, is fairly clear. It's harassment and or sorry, that harassment and discrimination would fall under human rights. That's why it's not specifically mentioned. Charlotte on Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, and that was that was kind of one of the reasons that we had that we had talked about that earlier in discussions on the on drafts of the Residential Tenancy Act that this be this be included. I'm good for the section. Hey, thank Charlotte on West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Chair. You said that harassment and discrimination would fall under human rights. Did you get an opinion from human rights on that? No, we had an opinion from our legal team. Charles sure, Thomas Rowe. <laughs> Don't you think it would have been better to go to human rights to figure out what their opinion of that was? Well, again, my, my position has me ask our legal team questions. The question came to us, should this be added? We certainly took it to our legal, te legal team for consideration. And the answer back from our lawyers was that really the unreasonable disturbance would cover off harassment and that anything to do with the term discrimination really would fall more under human rights. And again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't, I don't have the ability to really sit down and think on, you know, it's, it's more of a, this is our legal opinion on how you should draft. Sure, that was royalty. In the, which section of the Human Rights Act, because obviously you would have had to look at that to, to make sure the legal would have had to look at that. Which section of the Human Rights Act would he be referring to that that is in the Human Rights Act? I'm not positive. Sure. Again, I, I, I don't typically question our legal folks. They're lawyers with years and years of experience in this area. I don't typically question them as somebody who's a non-lawyer. Charlottetown, what's your In Section 3 of the Human Rights Act, it, it protects tenants from um, not being discriminated against upon entry of the unit, so when you're renting the unit, and that's it. That's it. So not to have, not to be able to protect a tenant in this legislation here is, is an oversight. And I think that, have you heard about any, and does anybody else talk to you about discrimination or giving, giving you advice about discrimination um, in this act during your consultation? Well, certainly we received um, we received requests from members of the public, um, from stakeholder groups, 
to have this terminology placed into the Act. Um, but again, when it, when it comes to my role, my role is to take these requests and put them through our legal process. And that legal process came back and said, you know, we certainly understand the intent, uh -huh. but the more appropriate is to follow, the, you know, processes of the Human Rights Act. And so that's the decision that I followed. Charles, how much royalty? Yeah, and, and this is a this is a problem for for me anyway. Like just bringing it forward, like this is a problem, and I'm going to have a debate with you, I think, in the next little while. So I'm just, um, I, I just, I, I think that if somebody's discriminated against, if there's two tenants and somebody's discriminated against, they have nowhere to take this, and what you're saying is they have to go to the human rights process, but that process is for public, is is basically for public. Avenues. It's not for things that happen in your in your private areas. So I, I think that we're missing we're missing um, some very important keys here and in a couple other sections. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I certainly don't mind going back and and checking that a little further. Um, just to make sure that there's not an oversight. So we can certainly do that. Go back to Absolutely. legal and uh, and check into that uh, just to just to make sure. So I've got no problem bringing that back. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. Can we get the legal opinion? Can we get a copy of the legal opinion that you used to come to this conclusion? I don't believe I'm able to share that now. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. Well, why? I believe that would be covered under solicitor client privilege. Cheryl But again, I'm not an expert in that area either. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. Outside of the legal opinion, so you got how many legal opinions do you get? It's, it's, it's one opinion. There may have been more pre people involved in it. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. Was it a government lawyer? Yes. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. So outside of the government lawyer, you did not seek any. Uh, oh, here's a better question. Was that lawyer versed in human rights? I don't know their qualification, member. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. <coughs> did you think at that time to get a uh, legal opinion outside of government? That wouldn't be my normal process. Charles Thomas Royalty. Um, I guess uh, the talking about discrimination. Did you did you consult with um, uh, Black Cultural Society or BIPOC Usher? They provided BIPOC Usher provided a submission. Yes. Charles Thomas Royalty. Can we get that? Um, can we get that submission? I believe you could ask them for it. I don't think they'd withhold it. Um, and I don't know that there's anything on our side that would, would ask us to withhold it if they were wishing to provide it. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. There's an anti-racism policy person with the, within the Premier's office that his number one duty is to look at legislation. That's the, the role and look at new legislation that came down. Did you get a legal, or not a legal opinion, but did you get an opinion from that position? We did, yes. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. Can you share that? His opinion was similar to BIPOC Usher in that he felt he wished that this would be in the legislation. The request from BIPOC Usher, he was aware of it, I believe. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. <clears throat> so when you get that opinion, and it's strong, and that's his role and duty, um, sh 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 should, I, should I expect that to be in here? or? Well, again, member, I, I'm not an expert on yeah. human rights. Yeah. I've made that extremely clear, I think. Um, but I do think that, you know, the, and, and again, I use the term opinion. Yeah. This may not have been a legal opinion, like, that, you know, in paper, this is a legal opinion. But in the discussions that we had with our legal team, they were quite clear that when we spoke of discrimination, we were starting to cross from an agreement between landlords and tenants into an area that is covered by the Human Rights Act, and that legislation should not bleed into other legislation, that if it's covered somewhere else. Um, I, I, you know, so that's what I'm working from, is this, this basic tenant that, you know, tenant, the basic concept that um, landlord, or sorry, you know, when you have an agreement between landlord and tenant, that's contract law. This provides greater clarity, this act, on that contract law. But when you speak to something along the lines of discrimination, and I certainly understand how important this is, um, but when you get into that, that we try and keep legislation from bleeding over, 
Um, so that's, that's the process and the concept that I'm following drafting the legislation is that now, as the, as the minister said, if, if there's a position um, that we can seek from another person or another group to make to ensure that that is true, that this does bleed over and that there is a process in that act or there is not, uh -huh. that's something we can certainly discuss and look at. And, and, and I think it does bleed over because I'm looking at an example in this own in, in this own legislation under in section 56 family violence has the same meaning as victims of family violence act so I mean that that's not a bleed over that's a that's a that's a pullover that's you know? a very different look at that that section is very different than this section member Charles Thomas Rose. that's just providing a definition to say if you want the definition of family violence look to this one it's not saying that the director of uh, rental office uh -huh. will hear a hearing based on a person coming and saying I'm being discriminated against, um, which under the current rules or the current laws would be heard under, you know, if there was no Rental Tenancy Act, that would be heard under the Human Rights Act now. Uh -huh. And so there's a, very, there's a very different way of looking at that. This is pointing to that and saying, if you need a definition, it's already in law, and here's the definition of it. Um, <coughs> the, uh, I, I, I already gave you the floor, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my question is, why didn't you use the definition of discrimination, the human rights definition of discrimination? Uh, the, we have a definition there. Remember? Oh, perhaps we don't. No, I'm sorry, we do not. No, you don't. Sure, I'll tell royalty. So I guess. But again, my, well, my okay. So the answer that a separate way though is, we don't have the term discrimination in this act. Sure, I'll tell royalty. And I can't, I can't sit here as a legislator and say that we're bringing a new tenancy act. And we don't have the word discrimination in the entire act. Um, that's that's my point, uh, I guess. And. Uh, um, even this section and some other sections. So this this is, we, we don't, we, we take, when, when you said we take it, we, we try not to bleed into other legislation, we, we have. And I'm wondering why, if we use a definition under, to, to start off the, the document about housing is a human right, that we do not define it or do not define what exactly human right is or do not define discrimination in the new Tenancy Act. Do you think that was an oversight? Again, maybe it's something we should look into. Well, something we'll look into, member, and come back. Perfect. Yeah, and I'll be asking further questions. And I appreciate the uh, appreciate. I think this is a very, very, very good debate and discussion. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome, Cheryl Town Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, it's just a bit of a follow-on from from that one, and I appreciate, Minister, that you mentioning that you would be open to it. Um, in previous consultations, we had a number of, of organizations from the community provide letters that were very clearly outlined. Um, the need for recognizing that discrimination actually could, can, and does impair somebody's right to quiet enjoyment. And it's from two aspects. It's from discrimination potentially with the landlord and tenant, and then also discrimination happening tenant to tenant. So, so, there, so while absolutely the Human Rights Act does prevail over tenancy legislation, you know, as per Vernon's point, that we have an overarching piece, the specific application here is about the right to quiet enjoyment and the fact that when we have a four-year process to go through through a human rights complaint, um, there needs to be something in that space that says, what do you do to ensure the issues are dealt with in a timely manner? Because otherwise, it's adversely affecting the agreement that we have that says the tenant has a right to quiet enjoyment. And, that, and it's, that, it's that complexity that I, that I think is the focus, um, you know, absolutely recognizing my colleagues' points, but that we have, we know that the Human Rights Act pre prevails, discrimination is a real thing, and that we have a very specific commitment to the right to quiet enjoyment. So, you know, perhaps we could provide you with those letters. They were provided in the previous consultation, but we can give those to you again. But it would really be good if we could come back and look at this from that perspective, that the four-year turn turnaround for a complaint means that you are denying somebody their housing rights, which we've said was a priority. Um, so, Chair, um, I'm, I guess my, my question would be: Do we need to? Would we? Do we need to leave this section, Chair, if we're if we're waiting on something to come back, or can we just sort of say that we are open to maybe looking at that after the fact? 
as an outstanding item. I'm not quite sure what the procedure would sure. be there. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Certainly, I want to make sure this is a strong piece of legislation. So, uh, I've got no problem if uh, if we wanted to put this section on hold and move on, which would give us 24 hours to go back and and check with the department as well as I'd like to get a second legal opinion as well and uh, bring it back. Okay. So basically, we could do the same as we did with Section 11. We'll mm -hmm. ask if it's the wish of the committee that we put this section on hold until that information comes back, and then we'll. We'll go back to section. So is it the pleasure of this committee that we hold section 22 until information is brought back uh, for further debate? No. Yes. yes. Okay, so we will go ahead with that. Thank you. So section 22 is now on hold. Uh, section 23, landlord's right to enter rental unit restricted. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. In um, clauses B and C, landlords need to provide written notice 24 hours before entering. Um, and I'm wondering how would this written notice be given? Typically it would be placed on the door, I believe, <clears throat> if the landlord couldn't contact the tenant. Cheryl Tom, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And do you have any concerns that a tenant might not actually receive said notice? That's not, I'd have to talk to the director if that's been a concern in the past. We didn't hear that in consultation. Cheryl Thomas, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering about recourse. If, if, you know, if a tenant doesn't receive notice and, and the landlord shows up at their door, what, what options they might have there? Well, again, I, I'd have to speak to the director on, as to whether this is something that happens commonly, and if it does, what is, what is the recourse for the tenant? Charlotte Hammer, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. On, in Clause F, it talks about um, the tenant has abandoned the rental unit. And from a legal perspective, how is that determined that a, a tenant has abandoned a unit? Yeah, we have that. Uh, it's, it's given out very specifically in the further section of the Act, talking about abandonment of unit. And it's a, quite a detailed section on what's, what, is, what is involved there. Charlotte Hammer, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, so in Clause H, the third one, um, the entry is between the hours of 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. And wondering for um, a tenant who works nights might sleep during the day, are there any provisions made here for accommodations in cases like that? No, this is quite clear that the, the entry would be between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. and that would be certainly what would be most appropriate for the great majority of tenants. <laughs> would certainly hope a landlord would take into account the situation of the tenant, but this really is to protect the tenants by and large to make sure, you know, a landlord who may be a night owl isn't coming in later than that. Charlotte and Victoria Park. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. I'm good for this section. Shall this section carry? Carry. carry. Section 24, tenants' right to access protected. Charlotte and Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. It says a landlord shall not unreasonably restrict access to a rental unit and common areas of the residential property. Um, what would be considered a reasonable reason to restrict someone's ability to be in a, or sorry, what would be a reasonable reason to restrict a tenant's access to a unit? That would, that would totally vary and be based on what the director, you know, is hearing in the case. The director would decide whether it's reasonable or, or not reasonable. Charlottetown Victoria Park. And that was my next question. If there was a dispute, would it be the director who yes, would, would be, be responsible for that? Okay. Um, so would this mean, for example, that landlords couldn't restrict parties? Again, member, you're, you're asking me something that, you know, you're getting into a, you know, a hypothetical on what would the director say in this particular case. Um, you know, I, I couldn't answer what the director would say in a particular case. And when you use the term party, you know, that could be two friends over for lunch or, you know, or it could be 40 people over with loud music. So I, I don't know what the answer would be there. It would have to be, you know, a little more, uh, a little more directed as what a party is in your question. And then I could certainly ask the director, is that what's envisioned by this? Or what is the current process in that situation? Is that what the act speaks to? Charlottetown Victoria Park. Um. So if, if the director is the authority on this, it, ha, like, yeah, I, I'm good for now, Chair. Okay. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 25, tenant not interfere with quiet enjoyment of other tenants. Shall the section carry? Carry. carry. 26. 
prohibition, changes to locks and other accesses. Shall the section carry? Carry. 27, security devices. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you specify what devices are being contemplated in this section? Well, again, it, it's quite clear what it says in terms of, you know, that the, the device has to be necessary to make the residential property reasonably secure. So, and then the director would decide whether that device is reasonably secure. So if a tenant felt this lock, this device doesn't leave my unit reasonably secure, they could seek, you know, the, the decision of the director that, a, something, that something better has to be provided to make it more reasonably secure. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. So are we, are, is this more access devices or is it also surveillance devices? Would that also be included under here? Uh, again, it, it, just, it just says exactly what it says. The device is necessary to make the residential property reasonably secure from unauthorized entry or installed. <clears throat> if a tenant felt that something more was needed, they could apply to the director to say, I feel that this section of the act is being contravened, that my unit is not, reason is not reasonably secure based on the security that's provided and could provide that information to the director. Charlottetown Victoria Park. I'm good for there, Chair. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Yes. 28, obligation to repair and maintain. Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, um, just, just the, this is similar to what's in the, the other act, but I, I'm just wanted to have a discussion too because in my area I, I get stuck between this and, and the next couple sections about what Fiona did. And, you know, like how have we, have we looked at the, the impacts of Fiona on tenants and landlords when you're involving insurance companies and, and, and timely, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm working with a couple that, that it's, 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 it's no, there's so many people to, to blame for not having it repaired. Mm -hmm. um, are, have we done enough here with this section, given what we know now what Fiona did? You're sort of asking for an opinion, and, and I don't have the conversations that you've had with your with your uh, with your constituents. So, you know, to say is there enough? The act was written pre-Fiona. Um, we have looked at it again, um, you know, but it talks about that the, that the landlord has the obligation to maintain the resident's property in a state of repair. Now, that you know complies with health and safety housing standards required by law. And having regard to the age character, this, that wouldn't really apply to Fiona B. Um, so really we're talking about, you know, does a tenant feel the landlord's not doing enough? And if they do, would they go to the director? Um, and I wouldn't be aware one way or the other. I, I guess I can make a presumption that some folks have and said, you know, this needs to happen faster. But uh, you, you may be aware of more yeah. cases than I do. Charlottetown West Royalty? Yeah, but I mean, one one A is is definitely not. It's and it's not it's not the the necessary the landlord's fault in the situation. It's just that they're dealing with insurance companies. Um, it's three degrees upstairs. There's a service master has come in and remediated everything, and here we are where where tenants are are living in a situation that's not not acceptable. And if they go to the director, we're looking at decisions three or four months down the road, which is, you know, I'm Since just... the director's decisions don't take that long, member. Yeah, okay. But if, they, if down the road, I mean, so they're looking for compensation, but there's nothing the director can do in that situation. Can we, and maybe if, if people are watching, can we look at a, a clause? Because if, if Fiona happens again, it just... We're here we are six, seven, eight weeks later, and, and um, yeah, it's not suitable. She would win on A, um, uh, but it's, I'm just trying to keep, keep, keep something, making sure that we have enough in here that's, that's going to deal with emergencies like that in the future. Yeah. Charlottetown West Royalty? Um, no, that's it. I just, more of a statement. Thank you. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, subsection 1, where it's, it talks about standards required by law. I'm wondering what standards are required by law in this act? Standard required by law, it doesn't specifically say here, but, uh, you know, the, the um, let me just pull it out. I have a copy of it. So the Public Health Act rental accommodation regulations would be one that certainly applies. Charlottetown Victoria Park. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, so the property uh, must be kept in a state of repair. Having regard to the age, character, and location of the rental unit makes it suitable for occupation by a tenant. Does this um, lower the property standards for some tenants? I would not. I'd have to ask the director. I think, again, this is a question that, you know, if a tenant believed that a building was not up to the standards, um, that they could apply to the director to say, I would like to see these changes made or I would like to see this remedy happen. Um, my understanding is quite often when tenants are coming under this situation, uh, not this particular B, but just in terms of repair and maintain, sometimes the request is, can we break our lease and move somewhere else because we don't feel that this is being met? And then it would be up to the director to decide, do I feel that these aren't being met and is it reasonable to say that this tenant their landlord agreement can be broken and they can, the tenant can leave. Um, but that's really the extent of the conversation I had in, as, part of my, uh, as part of my talk with the, with the director's office in terms of how this sort of operates. Cheryl have Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for that. Um, Clause A, we know that cleanliness was one of the motivators um, to try to evict tenants at the Causeway Bay Hotel. And I'm wondering if you can explain what ordinary cleanliness means for the purpose of this act, and are there plans to elaborate on that more in the regulations? So right now in the act, it is exactly what it says, and again, it would come down to the director's decision on providing evidence on either side. So, you know, if the... Uh, you know, the tenant is responsible for ordinary, ordinary, uh, ordinary cleanliness of a rental unit in all areas of the residential property used exclusively by the tenant. So this would be a situation where the landlord would feel that they are not doing this and have asked for a decision from the director. Um, and so there would be evidence provided and then the director would decide, does that meet the standard based on their experience, based on their knowledge of ordinary cleanliness? Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And um, for Clause B, where it says um, tenants are responsible for proper sorting and, disposi and disposition of garbage, but some tenants report that other tenants, they're like, well, we hear it all the time that um, people aren't sorting their garbages properly. And as a result, I, I was at Champion Court the other day when, and they, they were telling me that this happens, the garbage truck drives in and then it looks and backs up. And while I was sitting there, that's exactly what happened. And so um, does that, how are, are those sorts of issues dealt with under this act? Because that's not, that's not the only example that I've heard happening around garbage disposal and, and no pickup. We, we clearly heard that too from both tenants and landlords that this is a, this is a major issue, um, that there are tenants who don't <coughs> properly dispose of waste. Some cases they use other tenants' garbage cans, in some cases they use their own. It is very difficult, um, and it's very difficult for an act to get into a specific in terms of, um, you know, what has to happen. But I, it, it really would come down to, in this case again, what we're discussing is does a landlord or another tenant feel a second tenant or, you know, is it a tenant feeling another tenant or is it a landlord feeling a tenant are not properly sorting waste and impacting their, their uh, enjoyment of the unit or their ownership of the building? And then do they want to seek some sort of a, a remedy from the, uh, the director? Uh, and again, there would be administrative penalties available. I think that would be quite extreme. But again, that's, that's what this envisions is. And it's very difficult, um, you know, when we get into a large building with a number of units to try and police that. I certainly understand that. Um, but this is, you know, in terms of this piece, it really is difficult to write a piece of legislation that envisions policing garbage disposal amongst, you know, 24 different tenants in a parking lot where the garbage cans are. So it really just states that you are responsible for the proper sorting and disposition. And then it would be up to someone to say, I believe this person is not, and here's my evidence. Charles on Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, so in subsection four, a tenant has to make repairs in a professional manner. Um, does that mean that people have to hire a professional or like, does it preclude people from making repairs themselves? So I'm just wondering what professional manner. So good and professional is a term. We had this discussion, thank you, when, when we were working through this. And good and professional really talks to the fact that, you know, the tenant has 
created undue damage of a landlord's property. Um, if, they can if they can repair it themselves professionally, that's appropriate and that would be at the discretion of the director. But, you know, I've repaired my own walls, um, chip rock my own walls. I wouldn't say that I would be qualified to do so in a, in a, in a landlord's building, um, but it's fine for me, but it's not, it's not a good and professional manner. Um, so it would really, though, it would come back to the director to see evidence of what was provided and what was done and to say, I don't believe that's a good and professional manner. Charlotte, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And just a clarity point on that. So if, let's say, I were in a building and, and we had to do some uh, uh, painting or repair a, a hole in the floor or whatever, can, is there anything in place, like, is there something that I can do proactively or does it take me at me trying to fix the floor and then the director saying yay or nay? Is there something that I can do beforehand that says I actually have expertise in this area? Like, how does that work? Um, anecdotally, I've heard um, discussions where tenants have come to their landlord and said, um, I believe, you know, here's my qualifications, I believe I can fix this. That said, I, I believe, you know, it really would come down to after the work is done. That's what the Act envisions, is that it has to be done in a good and professional manner, and it would be to the landlord to say, I don't believe it was, and I would like to seek, you know, Compensation. I would like to seek a professional person to do it. Those types of things. And again, I, I, I don't know the specifics on it, but I, I don't believe, I think it really would come down to the very end of what work was done and, and does the landlord feel it was good and professional. And if they didn't, they would take that to the director. Charlotte sure, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And my last question on this section, I'm wondering um, what is considered reasonable wear and tear in subsection 5? That's a common question. There is no specific answer on what is reasonable. It, it would be based on a number of factors in terms of time in the unit. Um, you know, uh, year, again, years in the unit, I think, is, is a major factor. Um, but again, this is totally at the discretion of the director in terms of hearing the evidence of you know, we hear war I heard worn carpets on, on both sides um, during the consultations. And uh, really, in terms of how this works is, you know, if you've been there in a unit for 10 years with wear and tear on carpet, you know, the director may take that into account and say, no, reasonable is, is this amount of wear. It, you know, if you've been there one year and you've been wearing you know, heavy boots or something across the carpet and have damaged it, that may not. But again, that's totally at the, that's at the direct discretion of the director to see the evidence and then move forward with, I believe this is reasonable or not. There, you couldn't, you could never come up with a, a guide to say these are reasonable and these are not. You may come up with examples. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. I'm good chair for the Thank section. You. Charlottetown, you. Belvedere. Um, I just wanted to circle back to the a couple of the different points that have been raised here around um, repair and maintain the ordinary cleanliness, wear and tear. Um, and I know that you have the process that comes up later on in section 75 that allows for the, the you know, resolving disputes piece, but both the capacity to decide <coughs> how to interpret what those things are, like wear and tear and ordinary cleanliness, and the capacity to decide whether something can go to a dispute sits with the same person, with the director. And having spoken to many tenants, their knowledge about what um, is constituted in terms of you know health and safety and housing standards in law, or ordinary cleanliness, or any of those things, I, I just don't know how you're empowering tenants to know what their basic rights would be to even know that they could dispute any of this. Like, I've had tenants contact me saying that the heat's been turned off in their apartment, and they didn't know that it was a legal requirement under health and safety to provide heat, if, the, if that's the agreement with the landlord, or that the water's been turned off. Um, so we can't assume that everybody knows these things, and if it's not clearly laid out in here, I'm really concerned about all the authority sitting with somebody who isn't necessarily accessible, and there's nothing in writing anywhere here or in legislation that says, as a tenant, here are the basic things, the basic guidelines that you can expect as a tenant that your landlord should provide you. Do, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, like there's a I lot do, of I do. I just, I'm not here. sure I heard a question, remember? 
Yeah, okay, so I'll be as clear as I can. You have complies with health, safety and housing standards required by law. What are the health, safety and housing standards required by law? What are the five main things that, 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 that a tenant should expect that the landlord provides under that piece? What Certainly. is the benchmark for ordinary cleanliness? What is the benchmark for wear and tear? How does a tenant know that they even have the right to go and make a complaint if we don't know what those things are? So in this, so I'm, I've, I've opened up the Public Health Act rental accommodation regulations, and they're, they're not the most extensive in terms of distance, but they are very clear in certain areas on what has to be provided. In, and again, this is in certain areas, um, just as an example. So light, every habit habitable room shall be provided with one or more windows opening directly to the outside or the external air. Ventilation. Every bathroom or room containing a toilet or urinal shall be provided with ventilation. Uh, space requirements for sleeping. No person shall rent or allow to be rented or occupied as a sleeping unit or for purposes for sleeping any accommodation unless there is available not less than 50 square feet of fo floor area for each, each and every occupant. So these are some of the examples of what is provided for in the Act. Um, again, when you get to a dispute, and that's what we're discussing is, is dispute. So if, and I'm... Chair, can I just qualify, please? Um, I'm not... uh, the, the stranger still has the floor. I don't know if he's finished. Potable water. The owner of a dwelling unit, housekeeping unit, apartment, or other rental accommodation to which these regulations apply, which would be apartments, um, shall provide hot and cold running potable water under adequate pressure in all kitchen and bathroom facilities. So these are heating. All buildings and dwelling units shall be weatherproof and capable of being adequately heated with a responsible consumption of fuel and heating equipment. Any building or dwelling shall be in working order and in good repair. So clearly right there, if the tenants had their power shut off or their water shut off, that landlord would be, have, you know, the tenant would have the ability to go to the director or to the director's office and file, you know, an application to say this landlord has shut off my water, this is in violation. To your point, you know, we could certainly discuss better ways to, to, uh, to, um, to notify the public of some of these things. There's, there's, you know, you can always do a better job of notifying the public. Charlottetown Belvedere. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a big piece of this because, I mean, you know, you refer to the law, but you don't say which law it is. And I know from our work in here, like we've been working on these files long enough that we know we have them all, all things bookmarked of what we need to go and look up when we have to help a tenant. But as a tenant, um, your there's a lot, there's a big jump from the this my landlord did it, this to me oh, you know, here's the nine steps I need to do. And, and some of that is, like, to us it makes sense because we deal with the law and we're used to looking at looking these things up, we're used to reading these things. But as somebody who is an ordinary islander, yeah, it's, and it's very hard to put ourselves out of that position when you've gotten used to reading legislation. But let's be really clear, none of this is easy or accessible, especially if you don't have a computer or you have a low literacy level or you just don't know even what it is you're searching for. So that there's a big jump from it shall comply with health and safety standards to here's the act, here's what it says, and by the way, you know, here's the list of stuff that you should check. So that's the reality. I mean, this is the reality of act, the actual calls that we get. Um, and so there is, there is a really big gap there. And, there. and the other challenge that we have in here that I'll, I'll raise again, and I'm not sure how you address it, but if the director is the authority, what guides them in making their decisions does really matter. You continually refer to the, the director gets to decide, but that's that more and more sounds subjective. When you're talking about ordinary cleanliness, that's a really big scope. And I'll be really clear, I don't have to ask a question, Chair. I am not just allowed to make a statement. You are um, making a statement now. Yeah, yes. I am, absolutely. But, um, but there is... There is a subject, a very large subjective piece happening in here with the director, who also has the authority to hear those disputes. And I think that is a power imbalance that we haven't talked about enough. And I would really like to know, Minister, what are you going to think about in terms of further action you can take to better protect and support tenants when they need to bring a dispute against a landlord that they have a disagreement with? How will you support them? Charlton Belvedere. 
I just asked a question of the minister. Yeah, and the minister what didn't respond, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, honorable member, this obviously has been in the works for three and a half years. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. And there's much more to, to do. But I know it's a better piece of legislation than uh, the current one now. So um, obviously, I'm not opposed to looking at absolutely anything that's going to strengthen and improve the legislation. Um, any issue, I don't mind going back to the department, sitting down, and, and going through it. Charlton Belvedere. Thank you, and I agree, it is better. Absolutely, it is better. What we're doing, though, is with the opportunity to, to debate it here, is we're pointing out some spaces that, that, so that we don't put this aside and say we're done, because we're not. And I recognize that there is not interest in right now in making further major changes, though it doesn't mean we're not going to try. But, um, but, and some of these things aren't legislative, Minister. Some of these things are about better communications and having people be better informed about their rights and being less afraid, because right now the system is not one that makes people feel comfortable. It's really scary to go to the director and file a dispute and do paperwork. It's really frightening. Um, and so I'm hoping that that means that as we have this dialogue that it, it can open up further places that we can continue to discuss how we can strengthen this after we're finished here in the House. Um, I'll save my other questions on this for when we get to section 75 around the dispute process because I think they're more relevant there. So thank you for the time. Okay, thank you, Charlton Belvedere. Charlton West Royalty. Oh, thank you. Um, I just want to, there was something I missed, so with the indulgences, Chair, um, I just want to ask a couple on 25 before it goes too far. I'll That's ask okay. our promoter. Is that okay? That's fine. Yeah, yeah. okay. Just, um, so the tenant shall not interfere with quiet enjoyment of other tenants. And it says the tenant and any person admitted to the res residential property by the tenant shall not unreasonable interfere with the rights that that word rights how, how how did we define that word in terms of this this is part of the original draft that's been on with me for a number of years and was drafted a number of years before that I haven't got into the actual specifics of that word in that section of this act yeah Charlottetown West Royalty. <laughs> I noticed I went back and tried to find it in definitions, and we, we that's that's what I'm saying. Like if we were to even look at that, and to, uh, I might make a like to even add human rights, right, right there. If we were to, like, you cannot, you cannot unreasonably interfere with the human rights of what. I, I just don't understand how we define rights, and then uh, would would that be some like are these type of things that like if if we don't define rights like. I don't know what that definition is for people. Do you think that's, is that, is, is that a gap? Again, honorable member, I, I do see your line of question, but the yeah. definitions have been passed. Um, I, I do see what your question is. I'll pass it if the Chair. stranger wants Chair. to answer that. Chair. I, I'm gonna give it to the stranger well, first if I'm they just, would like to. The definitions are passed, but rights isn't there. So I understand that. So, but what I'm saying to you is the definitions have passed. I'm giving the stranger the opportunity if he does want to answer your question based on what you had said, but again, about the not being in the definitions, but the definition section we have passed. Sure. It, it's a valid question, Honourable Member. I have no problem going back and asking uh, the Department and legal on your behalf with that. Uh, I don't think we have the answer here, but yeah. I've got no problem going back and checking into that. Yeah, Thank you. I, I appreciate Shall it. Have and you know, that's all, that's all I have. I'm just like, I'm looking at opportunities that, mm -hmm. that we can strengthen this, so great. Thank you. Thank you. And you don't have any questions on Section 28 specifically? Uh, no, number? no. Okay, Thank perfect. You. Thank you. Leader of the uh, third party. Thank you. With your indulgence, I'd like to go back to Section 4 of, of 28. Section 28, if that's okay. Again, I will ask the promoter, and if that's all right. I don't think we've passed 28, have we? Or you're going to section four, did you say? Of 28? Yeah. Of 28, yeah. we're, on, we're on 28 now, member. Yeah, but where are you yeah. at on 28? Sorry, we're on section 28 right now, honorable yeah. member. I haven't quite got there. We're almost there, though. So are you at, are you at four yet? Yeah, the whole yeah. section the whole is open. The whole section's open. Okay, so you can ask questions on any, okay. section, any part of section 28. All right. I'm sorry, I had to step out just to see if I get this written up. I'd just like to make a minor amendment adjust, adjustment. A tenant of a rental unit shall repair, and it states now, in a good and professional manner. What I'd like to add in there is a tenant of a rental unit shall repair and have done the repairs by a professional tradesperson, and then, which would be done in a good and professional manner. I mean, there's lots of tenants that can fix things, but it's not done as good as it would be done. 
So I'd like to make an amendment to that, but I spoke to our chair. Yes. So, Honorable, uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to give the floor to the promoter. We can certainly look at the amendment, but I just, uh, first thing I think of, I understand what, what you're saying, but there would be um, a retired carpenter that is quite capable of doing that, even though it does not work, that still has the knowledge and ability to, to do that. So. I understand what you're saying, but there would still be people, even though they're not in the trades, they might have been in the trades previously, or uh, or so forth, right? So I'm just, I don't, I will certainly look at it uh, once we get it here, but that's the first thing that comes comes to mind with me. So, Leader of the Third Party, you do have uh, an amendment? It's that coming, so I ask, could we wait to pass that section until I get it? Yep. Okay, so we will. Uh, so there are no other questions on Section 28. So we will go back to yeah. section 28 um, once the amendment is here, if that's all right with the assembly, perfect. So we're now going to go on to sec section 29, emergency repairs. Uh, Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, in clause 4C, um, it says following those attempts, the <coughs> tenant has given the landlord reasonable time to make the repairs. Uh, does the department have any expectation of what would constitute a reasonable time to make repairs? Not at this time, no member. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, so the this is relevant because a tenant can't, can't claim reimbursement for any emergency repairs if they haven't given the landlord this reasonable time to make the repairs. Um, but in cases where where they're not able to to get in touch with their landlord or if the landlord's not, I, I'm speaking, I'm dealing with someone right now whose landlord has turned the heat off and the roof is still exposed and they're really, really worried about winter coming, but they, you know, they feel there's been reasonable amount of time, but, you know, I just think that it's, you know, we have to really consider that as we're considering emergencies. Was okay. there a question? Or? No, yeah. I'm just, just a comment. I think that that's, could be it could be stronger. Okay. Thank you, honourable member. Uh, are there any other questions? So, shall the section carry? Carry. Section 30. Tenant may sublet or assign rental unit with landlord's consent. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, so it says a tenant can sublet a union a, a unit with consent of the landlord, but the landlord can't unreasonably withhold consent. What would be a reasonable reason to withhold consent? Well, it, it speaks to one in subsection three. If it appears that the proposed sublet um, would result in an unreasonable number of persons, so that would again again it would be up to the director to decide unreasonable. But you know, if you look at some of the public health act and some other different. Uh, some other different concepts, you know, about CMHC and some housing requirements and things. If, if you had uh, an example of a, a couple who were had a two-bedroom apartment, and you know, they can quite, you know, easily say we're in we're in one bedroom, we can sublet the other, um, you know, to another person. Uh, I wouldn't expect the director to find that unreasonable. To another couple, to probably depend on the size of the unit. To uh, four college students who say they're going to get two bunk beds. Again, that may be something that the landlord would say, I feel that's unreasonable, and I would like to bring this to the director to say, I'm going to turn that sublet down. Or can you please, I, I'm, I feel this is unreasonable, do you agree, and, I, and if so, then I will turn this sublet down. Charlton Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. So is, is that kind of the only good reason to, to say no to that? Oh, is that the number of persons? I don't have the experience the director would have in years and years of hearing cases to know what a reasonable and unreasonable reason to withhold consent for a sublet would be, member. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. And I'm wondering, I mean, that's quite subjective. And so would we, would there be any other laws or regulations we'd be drawing from to determine what would be a reasonable amount of, of people? Or is that just kind of up to the director to decide? Not to my knowledge. I mean, sublet law, again, so when we look at this piece here, it's, it's always been allowed, you know, that a landlord has to allow a sublet if it's reasonable. Then that gets into, you know, contract law, which the, which the director is very familiar with, 
tenant law, which the director's familiar with. So it gets into those areas, but to say, you know, can you provide me with some examples of what is and what is not reasonable? Um, all I can say is that's the director's experience to come into play, um, to take a look at the situation and make a decision. Charlotte on Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. That's a whole lot left up to the discretion of the director, and I really hope that that we work on making every single decision transparent because that just is a lot of, it's a lot on one person's shoulders and it's a lot of authority with one person. Um, just a comment there. So um, in subsection six, it's to clarify, does the tenant have any responsibility or anything to do with the subtenant or is the subtenant accountable to the landlord directly? So there's two, there's two things that are commonly called sublets. One is an assignment, which we talk about in section or in sub five, which is where one tenant would typically leave, another tenant would take over, so the, the lease agreement would stay the same and it would be assigned to a new person. And the other one would be what's a, you know, a true sublet where the tenant would sort of, you know, might go away for the summer. A new person would sublet for the summer, um, but, anything that happens in the unit at that point would still be the responsibility of the tenant who's planning on coming back in the fall. So their obligations remain and it's really their duty to ensure that the person they sublet to in a, in a true sublet follows the, the obligations that they have under them. It, it, it's really up to them to sort of ensure that they're getting the right person in to sublet. Charlotte Home Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think this is my last question in subsection 10. How does the landlord determine if the if the tenant's charging too much rent to the subtenant? I'm wondering if, if there's like a subtenancy agreement with the landlord or what? Well, again, so there wouldn't be a subtenancy agreement. It would be the landlord hearing, you know, again, complaints based, the landlord hearing from the subtenant, you know, I'm paying this amount um, and the landlord saying, Okay, I feel I have to file something with the director here. They're in violation of the act. That's a greater amount than what's being provided for in my in my agreement. Charlottetown Victoria Park, good you're chair. good. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. So, first question is: Is there any um, guideline in the legislation around the landlord subletting the unit or changing the numbers of tenants in the unit? I'm not sure I understand your question, member. Could you uh, Are you suggesting the landlord would? No, you go ahead. You, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so I have a landlord in my district who um, has um, a multi bedroom unit, multi bedroom, multi bathroom unit, and he has taken two of the bigger bedrooms and installed bunk beds. So the existing tenants who are in there have the tenancy agreement on their own rooms. Um, but the other rooms now have bunk beds, which is not what they signed up for. Um, so I was just wondering what the protection is for tenants when a landlord chooses to bring changes into, because I mean, that's a sublet as well, really, but it's the landlord that's doing it, not the, not the tenant. And I'm just wondering how we, how we protect, because one of the things that's been raised by these tenants is they're concerned about whether it's a breach of fire code, having that many people in the building. So I, I don't believe that's a situation of a sublet. The sublet is, is looking at the situations where a tenant yep. brings in a new tenant. What you seem to be describing in that situation is a landlord changing what's in the agreement. Right. So that would be a change to the agreement, which the tenant would then have the right to file with the director to say, this is a change to our agreement. We agreed on this situation, and now we're changing it to this situation. So, so I, don't know, I don't know if that gets into a change in service, if it's mm. changed, but it's certainly a major change to an agreement that oh, yeah. the tenant would be able to file with the director. So change of use. Uh, Charlotte Van Belvedere, sorry. Thank, no, no, right, my apologies, Chair. So change of use, change of service, it would be more under that kind of basis. I, I can't, I, and again, yeah. I can't say for certain. Okay. Um, and I don't want to provide a whole lot of conjecture, but yeah, that's certainly not, that's a landlord changing what's going on in the building or in the unit is not a sublet. Okay. Charlotte Van Belvedere. Thank you. And then, and then the other piece around that is, is um, um, and you'd mentioned this earlier, when we come back to the sublet with a tenant and the tenant or sorry, sublet, the tenant is subletting their space, the agreement still remains with the original tenant. So is it the tenant's obligation to inform the subletting tenant of any rights and obligations that they may have while they're subletting that unit? I believe so, yes, yeah. Okay. Charlotte Belvedere. 
And, is there, and is, there's no requirement for that to be any written contract on file, like a secondary sublet contract, or is that, can, can that be a verbal agreement? You know what, I don't know that answer. Remember, I'll have to find out and bring it back. Thank I'm not you. sure if a sublet becomes, it would, it's a true sublet, if it becomes a secondary agreement that has to be provided. Um, yeah. I'll have to find out and bring that back. Charlotte Humbelvedere. Thank you. And the reason for asking that is because <laughs> I have a lot of rentals in my district. Just to be clear, 50% of my district is rental, so I have all the stories. <laughs> Everything that could happen with a rental probably has happened. Um, so what I have in my district is someone where they sublet the, the space and then with a verbal agreement, and then when they came back at the end of the summer, the sublet tenant refused to leave. So then it's how, who is in breach of contract? Is it, is it the set tenant and the sub-tenant, or is it the tenant and the landlord? And, and so the landlord refused to have anything to do with it, not my problem, but it's how do you then bring that forward as a dispute, because the dispute wasn't with the landlord, the dispute was between the tenant and the sub-tenant. So it is a contractual issue, um, but somebody's gonna wear it, because you know what happened in the end was nobody paid rent, and the landlord then had the problem. Um, and I recognize it's a very specific thing, but it is a very specific thing that could happen in this case, particularly when we have um, summer sublets or winter sublets with students, for example, which is what I see quite a bit of in my district. So perhaps if you could bring that back just a, as a, an asterisk. It's not a reason to stop this section, Chair, but it is, it is a, a, I think, something that's worth looking at as a potential a real thing that has actually happened and more than once. Yeah. And I appreciate that comment and uh, our stranger had said he will uh, look yep. into that and bring back what he can. So thank you, Charlottetown Belvedere. Right, Next. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, Chair. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to go to Charlottetown, uh, sorry, uh, leader of the third party. Thanks, Chair. So on this one, so you're basically saying that you can sublet if the landlord consents, right? Pardon me? You're saying that you, you can, it can be sublet if the landlord gives consent. Yes, the, the subletting has always been allowed in a rental agreement. So, leader of the third party? He can only not do it if he's got good reason for not doing it. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Leader of the third party? So, what happens when a tenant does it and the landlord's unaware? So, when we get to uh, subsection 10, the landlord may um, make, a, make an application to the director under section 75, which talks about um, orders or, or starts the process of an application to say, you know, the tenant has sublet or assigned the rental unit without the landlord's written consent, the landlord would then have to see, speak to the director on what I would like to see happen. You know, would it be, I'd like to see this stopped, which is typically what I hear, um, is that the tenant didn't come to me for consent, so I would like to see this process stopped. Um, so that's the leader of the third party? So that's what you're typically hearing. What's typically happening? Are they being put out? I don't, I'm not aware of that member. I'd have to go back and check. Well, it, 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 create, right it creates quite a safety problem if you have someone subletting and the landlord's not aware. And if there ever was an a, a fire or anything like that. Yeah, and that's why the Act makes it clear that, that's, you know, that you need the landlord's consent. But again, if someone decides to contravene the Act, the landlord has to have the ability to go to the director. I don't know what the landlord would ask. I mean, again, we're, we're presuming what would the landlord be asking for from the director. And they may be asking for a number of things that would be reasonable. So it would be up to the landlord to go to the director and say, here's, here's what's happening. Um, so again, you know, if you had a specific question on, and, and you did, um, you know, does this mean the subtenants are evicted, I believe was your question. That's my then, I can, then I can find it and bring that back. Thank you. Okay. We're going to third party. That's good. No, Thank thanks. you. Uh, Charlotte Tom Brighton. Yeah, I have a question in uh, subsection eight. A, uh, where, where you're not allowed to charge a subtenant more in rent than you pay yourself, uh, that seems like questionable. For instance, if you, what you're renting from the landlord is an unfurnished unit, which is typical, then you're renting, subletting a, a totally uh, furnished unit, might include, a, for instance, a personal car or dog or whatever. Uh, why shouldn't you be able to uh, charge more? Uh, same thing applies if you're, if for instance you're renting it out in the summertime when rental properties is, as we know, worth a lot more than it is during the winter time. So again, member, in this in this particular case, and that's a, it's an excellent point. But in this case, what the act is trying to make very very clear, and what the concern that has brought been brought forward was that. There are situations where 
um, tenants are renting apartments, moving out and applying for more rent or provide or you know asking the subtenant to pay more rent and actually profiting off of the unit in an illegal manner in terms of they've raised the rent beyond what's legally allowed. Um, so what this act is trying to ensure is that that doesn't happen. Um, that's that's what the intent of this piece is, is to ensure that. Charlotte on Brighton. I can kind of see the fairness in that. Um, it's more like an aside. What what happens if, uh, as we sometimes do, uh, an exchange of apartments or more informal, like if you have somebody cats it for the winter when you go to Florida, that type of thing. How are those arrangements covered by this? Okay, so an exchange of apartments. Like I, I go to Paris and they come to Charlottetown, for instance. Well, again, that, I, I think that would fall as a sublet and you'd have to let the landlord know this is happening. Yeah. Okay. Um, they couldn't unreasonably not, they couldn't unreasonably allow it. Um, in terms of cat sitting, I, I, I'm not sure cat sitting would fall as a sublet. <laughs> Charlotte Hound Brighton? I'm good. Thank, Thank you. Are there any other questions? Charlotte Section Carry? Yeah. Section 31, interpretation. Charlotte Section Carry? Carry. Section 32, fees to cover expenses. Shall it carry? Carry. Section 33, tenants' right to sell, lease, etc. Shall it carry? Carry. Section 34, no right of first refusal. Shall it carry? Carry. Section 35, restraint of trade prohibited. Uh, Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I'm wondering if you could talk to us in practical terms what this section is trying to achieve. Practical terms is that, um, so we're speaking to a, a mobile home site here now in this section. So in practical terms, um, the landlord would provide snow clearing for the park, st the streets of the mobile home park. The, uh, the tenant may have their own snowblower or somebody providing snow blowing services. The landlord can't restrict that. You know, the tenant can hire their own person to blow, you know, snow blow. That would be a, a practical example of that. The landlord can't say, I don't like company A, you must use company B. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Okay, that, no, that's good. Thank you, Chair. Excellent. Shall the section carry? Carry. Thank you. Uh, section 36, landlord's responsibilities. This is still under the same subsection of additional provisions respecting mobile homes. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. So along the lines of Section 35, I'm wondering, if, does Section 36 impose um, an obligation on landlords to share or communicate the reasonable standards to the tenant? So if you, if you look at G, and I think that's probably what you're alluding to, um, the mobile park has has rules um, that the landlord you know, has written. Uh, sorry. Um, they would have to provide a copy of that to the tenant. Uh, Charlottetown Victoria Park. Um, I'm good, Chair. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, so one of the, the pieces around the landlord's responsibilities, and you said about the written rules and any other requirements, is there a requirement for um, insurance? or insurance protection on behalf of the landlord for the tenants? I'd have to get back to you, member. Okay. Uh, Charlottetown, Belvedere. Uh, my, I have a similar question on, on section 37, so I'm good with 36. Okay. Uh, 36, Charlotte Carey? Carey. Carey. Uh, 37, tenants' responsibility, Charlottetown, Belvedere. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry, Charlottetown, Belvedere. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, so this one is about that the tenant is responsible for ensuring that it complies with municipal bylaws or other enactment that applies to mobile homes or mobile home sites. So I guess my same question here, um, uh, that the, the landlord, can the landlord require, um, like in this case, can the landlord require, for instance, insurance or a level of insurance for the tenants, for them to be allowed to continue residency in the park or to take residency in the, in the mobile home park? Is that within their, their allowance? Not allowable? under this section, member. No, this section is very clear as it reads that, that, that a tenant is responsible to know the laws in their, in their municipality. Right. And, uh, and uh, so, I mean, if, if, if the law in a municipality was that 
you had you required it, then I suppose. But I mean, I, I've never heard of that. But I mean, it could be a bylaw somewhere to say this is required. But okay. it would be up to the tenant to to know their bylaws and to follow them. Charlottetown Belvedere. So we don't have a many mobile home parks as many as we used to. Um, but they are located primarily in municipalities. Is there a, and so, so you're saying that it's different municipalities are going to have different laws depending on where it's located and that, that each one of those is going to apply differently depending on the location? There's not a consistent application for mobile home parks? I, I don't believe that's what I said, member. I think what I said is that it's, you know, it's a tenant's responsibility under this act to know the bylaws in your area and to follow those bylaws. Charlottetown Belvedere. Are there any bylaws that apply to mobile units that we are that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of, no. Charlottetown Belvedere. Huh. Okay, that's um, really interesting. Thank you. I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, Charlottetown Victoria Park. I'm good, Chair. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Very good. Section 38, inspection at end of tenancy. Shall it carry? Carry. Oh, sorry, Charlottetown Brighton. I'm just wondering why this reference to the initial inspection that does that not come up for comparison or something like that, uh, that either party should produce at least one copy of that um, this is a separate inspection member so it doesn't come up here there are some sections later in the act that talk <laughs> about um, that the director shall take into consideration whether both were done but this is this section is, is is separate on its own. So it talks about must what must happen when you leave, um, and this is what must happen when you leave. So it it doesn't say back to no. This like this is be a separate form. It's a separate inspection, and it's to be done when you leave. Charlottetown Brighton. Well, I just mean if it if the initial inspection report inspection report says that uh, one of the faucets is missing and us. <laughs> Whatever it is, why why is that not relevant? To, uh, if the faucet is still missing on the final report. Well, again, members, so that this would get into a dispute where um, one party would say that that was missing, another party would not, and the reports would show clearly to the director where, whether it was or wasn't. So again, it's 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 a separate section. It's its own section, stands on its own, and it talks about what happens when you leave. Okay. It doesn't get into what situations occur between the two reports. It envisions that you have report A and you have report B, and they're both available for, to assist in the, in the uh, resolution of a dispute. Uh, Charlottetown Brighton? All right, I'm good, thank you. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 39, time to vacate. Oh, Charlottetown Victoria Park? Thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering what um, led to the 5 p.m. default time for people having to be out of their units on the day tenancy ends? I, it was there when I received the draft number, and I, I believe it's sort of a standard, but I, I don't have any, I don't have any, uh, any information on where 5 p.m. came from. Uh, Charlton Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And, and one more question on this. Um, one of the things that we hear quite frequently is the um, disagreement between tenant and landlord at the end of a tenancy when they're moving out in terms of um, clarity about what cleanliness should look like mm -hmm. and I've heard I've, this is probably one of the biggest things that I that I hear and I'm wondering does the department plan to provide a little more clarity on what this cleanliness when a tenant leaves should involve as of right now again member I, I, I feel pretty comfortable that and I, I do hear, um, we've heard from both landlords and tenants that this is a frequent issue. Um, but I, I really think that this act talks about providing the, the legal framework that allows the director to hear both sides and, and, and resolve a dispute. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I think that there's a, I think that this is another example in here that where a little clarity would go a long way to actually stop disputes before they come, you know, and that's, I, I think that this is a really huge missed opportunity for the department. I, I recognize this has been a, this has been a huge piece of work and never, it's been all hands on deck. Um, and I just think that, that we need to do a little bit more in terms of putting things in here as a preventative measure because everything, it seems like almost everything I've, 
asked questions on so far, go to the director, go to the director, go to the director, the poor director. You know, if we put some, some pretty, I mean, these are not difficult. Some of them are more challenging, but not all of them are really difficult to figure out. Um, so I just think that we could be really proactive in this rather than waiting, you know, than relying on the director to do all of these things. So I'm good for now, Chair. Okay, thank you, Charlton Victoria Park. Uh, shall the section carry? Carry. Okay, honorable members, um, I believe that the leader of the third party has his amendment for, so we're gonna go back to section 28. Um, can we get the amendment passed out? While the amendment's being passed out, uh, Honorable Leader of the Third Party, may, party, maybe I can get you to read in your amendment into the record, please. Purpose of it? First. All right, sorry. Uh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Leader of the Third Party. I'll get you to read the amendment in first, okay. and then I'll let you uh, give a comment to it. Okay, section 28.4 of the bill, of Bill 87, is amended by the addition of the words or to have repairs by a professional tradesperson after the word shall repair. Okay. So, honorable members, while the amendment is being passed out, uh, what I might do is open the floor to the leader of the third party, just uh, give a brief statement for the amendment. Well, thank you, Chair. As we all know, we all have friends that could do carpentry work or electrical or mechanic work. Uh, but let's say, unfortunately, the Chesterfield hit the wall where there was a electrical outlet and the person that came in was just a carpenter and they did the drywall and they fixed it, but they're not an electrician. The purpose of this is, is I felt that this, it should be done by a professional tradesperson. Now, if it's somebody that's retired, well, that's fine. If they were a carpenter or electrician, but, you know, if you fix a wall with drywall and you don't fix it right, it's very visible that it's not a very good job, right? If you don't sand it right or you put too much drywall, or too much uh, putty, so I felt maybe this should be done by a professional tradesperson. Okay, thank you, honorable member. Um, I'm not sure if everybody uh, has got a copy of the amendment yet, so we're just gonna leave it for just one second here. Is the, uh, do you have a copy of the amendment? Yeah, good. All right, um, so I believe that everyone has a copy of the amendment. I'm now going to open the floor to questions. Uh, Charlottetown, Brighton. Uh, I'm not so sure that I agree with the amendment. Uh, I think it's, it's actually clearer the way it was because I think to finish it professionally, it's really a higher standard than having a trademark in that may or may not finish it professionally. But that's just my opinion. Okay, thank you for your uh, comment. Uh, I'm going to pass it to the leader of the third party. We're talking about safety here, plus we're also talking about we've now adopted the National Building Code. So if things aren't repaired properly, it could be a safety issue. That's another reason for my amendment. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Honourable Member. Uh, Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. I recognise this is an amendment on um, 28, which is 28.4, which is regarding the tenant's responsibility for undue damage, but concerns regarding health and safety and electrical systems are actually in Section 29. So I don't know if perhaps the member has 
amended the wrong section. Or, um, but heating systems, uh, electrical systems, things that are actually necessary for the health and safety of anyone are under are under emergency repairs that are a completely different section. This this one was specifically around um, damage to the unit or common areas um, that the tenant causes. Um, and so I think we just need to be clear if we're using examples that the examples are actually relevant. And I would I would suggest that perhaps that a, a more the amendment would, is not appropriate for this section, given that we're talking about damage caused by a tenant that does not include things that bring our health and safety issue. Uh, Leader of the third party? Uh, I beg to differ. This certainly could cause issues, and I mean, it should be, repairs should be done by professionals. If they're in a common room or if they're in an apartment. The building was professionally built. Thank you, Leader of the third party. Are there any other questions? Shall we amendment carry? No. no. Um, I think I heard no, but I'll ask one more time. Shall the amendment carry? No. no. I heard no. Uh, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, uh, leader of the third party, your amendment is, <laughs> excuse me, does not carry. So we will move back to section 40. Just carry this. No, 49 uh, is ready. Chair, uh, carry the section. <laughs> Uh, carry section 28. Um, section 40, return of security deposit. Uh, Charlottetown Victoria Park. Um, we know that when some tenants move out, they require their um, their security deposit quite soon because they need that the access to that cash to apply um, it to the next rental unit. I'm wondering why the department settled on 15 days for the return of the deposit. This is a, an important change from the current act. Um, so in terms of the current act, the tenant has to file an application with the director to have their uh, security deposit returned. In the new act, the landlord, the onus is on the landlord to file with the director to say, I'd like to keep it. Um, but in terms of 15 days, that number was, you know, it's a number that was chosen based on some of the other language in the act around appeals and, and around timelines and what seemed appropriate um, based on, you know, discussions with the director's office or, or with, you know, as we're, as we're creating it. Um, there was no, uh, you know, no scientific study done to say 15 days is the correct number. Uh, Charlotte, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm looking at uh, subsection 5, and going back the, to the definition of security deposit, it's any money or property paid by the tenant to the landlord. And I, how do these provisions deal with the property part of the security deposit, if that's the case? So again, is a good point, Member, in terms of, to go back, I mean, the Act had a, had a section or you know, a clause in the section that talked about property. I've never heard of that being done. Um, security deposits are there. It was written to put that possibility in. Um, it's, it's never been done, and, and perhaps it shouldn't have been written in there. Um, but in terms of that, in reality, when, when there's a deposit done, it's, it's cash. It's, 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 a, it's, a monetary pol it's a monetary deposit, and this section speaks to that. Charlotte Town Victoria Park. I'm good, Chair. Shall the section carry? Very well. Oh, sorry, Charlotte Town Brighton. Well, I just had a, uh, had a concern, uh, uh, tenants moving from one apartment to another uh, are really hard up for cash and, uh, you know, the, with all the expenses of moving and they have to put a deposit down uh, on the next apartment, uh, I don't quite understand the 15 days. Um, do the tenants, for instance, when they move into the new apartment, do they get a 15-day uh, uh, respite before they have to provide it for the landlord, 15 days after the move-in? No, member. I, I mean, again, this is part of the agreement between the, land, the tenant and the landlord. Um, the landlord and the tenant would agree on when the, when the deposit is to be paid. Charlotte Hambrighton? Does it specify that uh, anywhere? 
I believe in a later section of the Act, it, it speaks to 10 days as the time frame that the landlord can feel that they're not going to have it paid and can start to take action, um, to ask the director to take action. Um, Charlton Brighton? It seems to me those two days should be uh, coordinated somehow. It makes a big difference to some, some tenants, I'm sure. Is there a question, sorry, Honourable Member? Um, no, no new question. Okay, thank you. Uh, shall the section carry? Yes, section 41, huh? landlord may retain security deposit. Shall it carry? Yes, section 42, abandonment of rental unit by tenant. Uh, Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. The department plans on coming up with a, um, a standardized form prov for providing notice under this section. It isn't envisioned in the Act, but there's nothing I would think that would stop the director's office if they felt it was necessary from creating one. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And, and in Clause 3C, uh, it, this is talking about what information should be posted on in a conspicuous place, an obvious place, um, on the residential property for landlords providing notice that they will be entering a, a unit that has been abandoned. And so would the same 9 a.m. to 9 a.m. hours apply in this case as well? Not as, not as this, act, this section is written, no. Charlotte Victoria Park. So does that help me understand here? So let's say it's been abandoned and there's been that notice put on the door for the reason to let the tenant know if they are to return that this is happening. And so, you know, if they were to return, would that 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. then apply or in, or in this case, no? Not specifically, no. It would have to say in this section that that applies. But to be clear, like, there is a very clear set of rules in sub, sub 2 that these, this is what has to happen for a unit to be considered abandoned in the first place. So the tenant has to, you know, to consider it abandoned, the tenant has to have vacated the rental unit. The tenancy agreement is not terminated in accordance with this act or the tenancy agreement, and rent is overdue, which is extremely important. So typically, it, it's quite clear. Now I, I say typically, um, it's quite clear that the rent is overdue. The tenant hasn't been seen in quite some time, and so the landlord begins to believe that it's been abandoned, and then they start these, this process of filing a notice to say, I believe it's abandoned, and I'd like to inspect to ensure that. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Good chair, thank, thank you. you. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Section 43, tenant's personal property. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Chair. Um, so in subsection 2, um, there's a reference to a safe storage. Could you elaborate on what that means? I don't believe safe storage is defined. Again, it would, it would be up to the director to agree. Um, you know, it, it talks about the use of the term safe storage or stored the property in a safe manner. So that's, that's what it would land on would be, you know, something that the director would agree is safe. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, in subsection 3, the sub subsection says that the section does not apply where a landlord and tenant have made an agreement in writing with respect to the storage of the tenant's personal property. Um, and we know that some tenants up and leave without, um, without the intent to recover uh, their, their property. Perhaps they're, they're leaving the province or whatever. So does this side agreement cover the disposal of the tenant's personal property if agreed to by both the tenant and the landlord? This would be a clause that allows the landlord to agree to store. Um, so it, it really, it, it's in this section because it's talking about tenant's personal property, but it, but it is an exception that talks about, it's more of a clause that allows the landlord to agree to store more than what would normally be allowed as part of an agreement. So again, it's for greater clarity. Um, <clears throat> so say a tenant had a three bedroom unit previously, they had enough property for three bedrooms, they're moving into a one, they can come to an agreement with the landlord to say, I'd like to take some space in your unit or in your building or in another building to store this, these other two bedrooms worth of furniture, and that would be the side agreement, so that would be the exception. Charlotte Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, so in subsection 6, 
um, application by landlord, they can make an, an application to dispose of the tenant's personal property without notice to the tenant. So in what, in what circumstances would, would notice not be given? So if you go through the, the entire process in terms of, of what happens, um, it talks about an authorization to dispose of below. It talks about the entire process walking through it. Um, and it talks about the landlord, for example, being able to sell the property after the storage period. So if the storage period of 30 days is done and the tenant has not come back and recovered the property, the landlord can sell it. But again, not at a profit. They have to then provide the funds to the director to hold on behalf of the tenant. Charlton Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm good for now. Okay, thank you. Charlton Brighton. I've gotten a few emails from landlords that can't quite understand why they should be uh, responsible for storing tenants' abandoned property. Could you clarify a little bit more how you arrived at the current setup? Well, again, so this this is this is applying and writing what the current process is, um, and I did find that uh, knowledge of this um, was not necessarily. Uh, not all landlords fully understood what their obligations were uh, under this section or under this portion of the current act. Um, it, it, it's, the current act is, is somewhat silent in some areas of this, but it is something that was important to go through. And, and by having both landlords and tenants come forward and say, what does this mean? Um, it shows that that's working in terms of, you know, there seems to be a lot more knowledge now on what, what the current obligations were under the current act. Um, so it really hasn't changed. If your question was, what's changed? Nothing has changed. Sure. Other than, oh, sorry, other than the 30 days. Previously, the director, the landlord would hold the property until they've gotten permission from the director to dispose of it. Charles on Brighton. Oh, good, thanks. Shall the section carry? Very Section 44, abandoned mobile home. Uh, Charles on Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, in subsection 4, there's a reference to the Personal Property Security Act. Can you explain what the implications of that act are with respect to the disposal of mobile homes? Sure. So Personal Property Security Act speaks to um, the assignment of, say, a loan on a piece of property. So, you know, the, the tenant may have had a loan on the mobile home. Um, the tenant has abandoned the mobile home. The landlord has to, and there's steps in the act to follow, to say this is what the landlord has to do um, to ensure that there is no outstanding lien or outstanding uh, mortgage on that property before they dispose of it. Okay. Shell Home Victoria Park. I'm good, Chair. Thank you. Shell the section carry. Carry. Section 45, seizure of personal property prohibited. Shall I carry? Carry. Oh, sorry, Charlotte Home Belvedere. Thank you. Yeah, it's just a it connects to the previous one around the mobile home thing. So so if you have a mobile home that you own, but it's on a property that is being um, you're you're leasing a, a space in a in a mobile home park and you're in breach of your rental agreement, your lease agreement with the landlord, does that landlord have the right to, to, to seize your personal property? Not the personal property, and so we, we've we've had a section that spoke specifically to abandoned mobile homes and what the process is there. Yeah. Now we've now we've moved back into seizure of personal property. So in general, again, a landlord can't enter a unit and take property. Say, you owe me last month's rent. I'm taking your couch. That you know that is a dispute. Non-payment of rent is a dispute that has to be uh, go to the director okay. for resolution. Uh, and this is just for greater clarity again to ensure that it's extremely clear that when there's if, if there's a belief that something that an obligation hasn't been met that for greater clarity no one can take the other person's property as payment for that obligation okay Charles on Belvedere thank you for the clarification I'm, I'm good thank you shall the section carry Section 46, mitigation of damages. Shall, uh, sorry, Charlton Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering if you could briefly explain what this section means, what it does. Sure. So, so mitigation of damages is, is again, it goes back to basic sort of contract law. If, if you breach a contract um, and there are, you know, for example, uh, rent. So, so a, a, a tenant agreement, landlord-tenant agreement um, says it'll be for one year. 
the tenant leaves at the six month mark, the, land, the landlord has a duty to try and refill the apartment or to re, you know, have another, a new tenant come into the unit as fast as possible. And they can't leave it empty for six months and say, well, you know, I couldn't get, you know, I want to now seek from the director six months additional rent from the tenant as part of the process. You know, and that's that's the basics of the pro of the of the idea of mitigation of damages. It, it it follows in a lot of different contract law where, if you feel that there's a damage being done, you can't just let it sit until the court case is is finalized and then say you owe me everything in the court case. You have to try and take some steps to say, you know, if I can make steps to make the amount lower, you have to take those steps. Shall on Victoria Park. Good, thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carried. 47, rent increases. Charlotte Karen? Carried. 48, timing of rent increases. Uh, Charlotte Town Victoria Park? Thank you, Chair. Um, in subsection 3, this says um, it's an exception. A landlord is not required to give notice under this section where the landlord makes an application to the director in accordance with section 50 for an additional rent increase. Um, when rent increase orders are made under that section, is the intent that the director will not apply those rent increases right away? No, what this, what this section uh, applies to is that um, if you're making a rent increase um, under, say, the, the maximum allowable, you apply, you, you, have, you must provide the notice. Um, if you're providing notice under Section 50, which then speaks to a different process for providing notice, you don't have to provide two notices. Charlotte Hunt, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, in subsection 6, um, the obligation of the landlord how do we know, so it says where a landlord has given a tenant notice of rent increase and the tenant ends the tenancy agreement in accordance with subsection 5, the landlord shall give a prospective tenant a copy of the notice with the name of the tenant removed before the parties agree to a tenancy agreement and B, rent the rental unit at the rent stated in the notice. Um, how do we know that this will not be abused in the absence of a rental registry and with the tenant not having the ability to determine what the, what the previous rent was and whether it's a reasonable increase or not? So, member, uh, again, we're getting into that that sort of that question that's been asked in terms of how do we know if someone's going to break the law or not? Um, so, I'm not sure I can answer how we know any one person will break the law. Charlotte Highway, Victoria Park, do you have maybe I, one last I question? I was just going to say we create a rental registry. That's what we do. I'm done. Thank okay. you. Okay. Shall the section carry? <laughs> Uh, honorable members, we have come to the end of government time, so we will now be switching over to the opposition's time. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? As chair of a committee of the whole house, having head under consideration a bill to be intitled Bill Number 87, the Residential Tenancy Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and beg leave to sit again. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Summer side, Wilmot. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Early Learning and Child Care Act Number 2. And I move, seconded by Charlottetown Victoria Park, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall I carry? Right. Bill Number 129, an act to amend the Early Learning and Child Care Act Number 2, read a first time. Overview, member? 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill ensures that all staff working in child care centers will be required to have a vulnerable sector check, and it also clarifies that people who do not work in child care centers while children are present are not expected to get that same check. This moves provisions currently in regulations into the legislation. The intent of this bill is to ensure the young, that youngest islanders are protected in consultation with the child and youth advocate. Stratford and the opposition house leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by Time Valley Sherbrooke that the 38th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Carry. Order 38, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act number 4, Bill number 128 in committee. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by Time Valley Sherbrooke that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take in con into consideration the said bill. Charlotte Carrot. Carrot. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow, Chair of the Committee of the Whole. The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Employment Standards Act number four. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Could you please state your name and position for Hansard? I'm Nathan Hood, Senior Policy Advisor to the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Nathan, and welcome. All well, members, uh, the bill is currently under debate. It has been amended, so and we're, it's opened up to questions as a whole as amended. Sure. And promoter? Sure. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, if with your indulgence, recognize a few people in the gallery, sure. if I might. Yeah. Um, so uh, I want to recognize um, from the PEI Working Group for Livable Income, we have uh, Dr. Susan Hartley is here, uh, as well as Ms. Michelle Jay, um, who is also with the, uh, the PEI Advisory Council on the Status of Women, um, and Marie Burge, who is with the Cooper Institute. Uh, we have Ains Kendrick uh, from the Women's Network of PEI, who is here in the gallery with us today. Um, we have Jane Affleck uh, from the Native Council of Prince Edward Island. Uh, Julia Hartley from the Lung Association. And uh, we have Larry Hale uh, from the UPEI uh, Faculty Association and Leo Chevry, um, who is a, a, from CUPE, as well as uh, PEI Federation of Labor. So I do want to acknowledge that uh, these are all representatives from uh, organizations who have, in our consultation, provided support for legislated pa paid sick leave. Um, as well, we have Bethany Caldicott-McNabb and Karen Lips, who have also joined us. Great. Okay, welcome. So I'm now taking questions. Any questions? So, Chair, I do have some 
response sure, to some of things that yep. came up. So, um, so Chair, uh, first off, you had a, a question about uh, uh, fishers in yes. particular and uh, lobster fishers. So we dug into that a little bit. Um, the uh, language in the Employment Standards Act around layoffs is, to be honest, somewhat vague. Um, so uh, it would really depend on the individual employment contracts, as far as we can tell. So whether the accumulation of sick days would continue for workers between the spring and fall seasons. Um, uh, disputes regarding those number of days in this context would be determined by the Employment Standards Board as needed. Uh, what we do know for certain is that it would end, that accumulation of days would end at the end of the fall season um, and very likely uh, could break in the middle or pause. It just, again, the, the layoff language is a little tricky and it would depend on those individual contracts. Is there anything else, Nate, that we can mm. add to that? No, I think that's... Okay. Yeah. So um, I do also have some responses to a few other things that came up in debate, um, just to clarify. So uh, I want to just comment on the, uh, the use of the special leave fund as the minister has um, tied it to this legislation or connected it to this legislation. I want to stress that the special leave fund is in no way a replacement for legislated paid sick days. Uh, the special leave fund provides all businesses, regardless of size or profitability, funding for paid sick days paid by government. Without legislating paid sick days, businesses have the choice of whether or not to access it. This is businesses being allowed to choose what is best for Islanders' health, not Islanders themselves. Additionally, there is no job protection for workers who need to take leave time due to illness in the Employment Standards Act. Workers could, could lose their jobs for following public health advice and staying home when they are sick. All of this is potentially very harmful to workers who are in the very best position to know their own health needs. I want to also comment on something that the Minister has said, um, that this extension of the special leave fund will be only until March. According to the Department's own website, the review of the Employment Standards Act will not be completed until at least July. And, and even then, it will be November at the earliest. And that's being extremely generous because the Employment Standards Act likely needs to be completely rewritten. And then at least another six months after that, extremely generous before regulations are ready and the act would be enforced. The PEI Advisory Council on the Status of Women has specifically said government must not wait until the Employment Standards Act review is completed, and I tabled that last week, or sorry, earlier. No, it would have been last week. Um, advice that this government seems to be ignoring. It's clear that the March timeline for completion of the review makes no sense. I can't understand why we're being suggested otherwise. We keep hearing the number of days is an issue as well. I've heard that from several members of this House. But no one has suggested a different number of days. I've provided evidence why 10, but if others feel it should be less, put a number forward. I I have shown a willingness to engage in this debate in good faith and make changes and compromises to get the strongest protections for workers that I can. And I think we can all agree that the number of days is not zero. The only groups pushing for zero days right now are business lobby groups. That's it. Will this government and third party members ignore all of the evidence I have brought forward to show the benefits of paid sick days for workers, businesses, the economy, our health care system? Will they choose to listen only to these business lobby groups and ignore everyone else, every other group who has spoken in support and stressed the urgency of legislating paid sick days now. When considering their vote on this bill, I ask that members of the Le Legislative Assembly consider all Islanders when making your decision. I ask you to think of the constituents you were elected to rep represent. I ask that you keep supporting, you work, support workers and our economy and the health of our economy by supporting legislated paid sick days. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Cheryl Town Brighton. Did you have a question? No, I oh. was just waving to my wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Shell the Bill 
Shall the bill as amended carry? Sorry. Does, did you point? <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing things. I'm hearing gesturing. I'm, I'm seeing gesturing. There is there somebody over on this side that has a question? Okay. Economic Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, members, and uh, thank you, member, for bringing this forward. And as I said, uh, I don't think there's anybody in this house that's against paid sick leave. And uh, I will. I I have made. Uh, I have signed an application to go to Treasury Board to extend the special leave fund, and uh, it's not, uh, I know it's not perfect, but uh, I think until the final report, which I am told will be done in March, and I will hold them to that, and so we can have what the uh, comprehensive review says about this, and I think with what they say, we can have legislation here next fall to for paid sick leaves off their recommendations. Uh, so, not a chance. Yeah, the honourable member uh, has the floor. Thank you, member. And it's it's always important to have debates. We don't always agree on how things are written. And uh, as minister of justice, uh, when we brought the NDA bill to the floor, I I had lots. There was debate on that as well, and. Uh, Timing is, uh, was important for that, and uh, it was important to have that debate. And the only thing I heard about that uh, from the, the law community that there wasn't enough debate on the floor because there's gray area in the legislation that they, the courts use to, uh, to review. And uh, on, so, uh, so I, you know, debate is important, and uh, I will ensure that the special leave fund, it's not perfect, but I will ensure that uh, it, it covers, it, it does, you know, uh, it does care for the children and the family members requiring uh, special leave, so that cannot attend school and stuff, so it does cover that, so it's not perfect, and I'll make sure it's, it lasts until we get a review in place, so thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you. May I respond to sure. that? Sure. Um, so Respectfully, uh, businesses having the power to make decisions about uh, the health and well-being of their workers is is far. It's not just not perfect. It's completely unacceptable. It really is. I appreciate. I appreciate that this government wants to support businesses in this transition. I think that's very important, and I've stated that for small local businesses in particular, they, they will need some support. The special leave fund is extended to all businesses, including those who really could afford it, and it empowers those businesses to decide when a worker is is worthy of taking a sick day. They, that is completely just unacceptable. Workers need to be empowered to make those health care decisions for themselves and their well-being. No business owner should ever be able to tell a person that they're not sick enough, they have to come to work. And Minister, I can't tell you how serious that is for uh, many of our vulnerable, uh, more precarious workers, those who are lower income, who cannot afford to lose a day's pay. Um, Minister, this is incredibly serious, and no, the special leave fund does not go far enough. Not at all. Okay, I have a question, and it's just again about, you mentioned about numbers, and I guess, I'm not going to say you challenged everybody, but to come back with another number. And, and I have to say, I'm, I don't believe zero is a number either, okay. but I don't know what the magic number is. And it, this is not my bill. I didn't go mm -hmm. do any public consultation from tip to tip, but I did ask, um, businesses and, and individuals, constituents in District 27 about it. And again, I had a mix, but the majority of, of businesses were like, well, what's being proposed? 10 is just, they thought 10 was unreasonable. Okay. So to find that magic number, I can't come up with it without some more consultation. Like, you know what I mean? Really, I know you could say, oh, we had a week or two to prepare for this, to, to do that. And I, and I tried to do that, but I still don't know what that number is. And I wish I did. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to put that on, on record for saying that that when you were challenging us to make an amendment, it, I don't think it's fair, I can only speak for myself, mm -hmm. to put a number forward when I don't really know what that number is, to make that balance between employer and employee. Mm -hmm. so. And, uh, Chair, I do appreciate mm -hmm. the challenge of choosing a number. Mm -hmm. For me, the number 10 was chosen based on 
evidence uh, based on other jurisdictions around the world and what uh, you know the the uh, what we're seeing here in PEI in terms of the actual number of days that workers need um, in a year to to maintain their health that what that they need to take it is 10 that is the number now if we do not feel here today as a legislative assembly that we can go as far as 10 I I think it would be um, a con just completely just disappointing and heartbreaking for those workers to have absolutely no protection uh, when no one is brave enough to say what number they think it should be to start. Um, I think we've seen BC has has legislated five days. Um, Ontario, uh, as I understand it, has three. I think five, you know, is something that, as I said, we've seen in BC. Federally, it's 10 for workers. So, you know, there are precedents. There are um, places to look to for what other numbers could mm -hmm. be. Um, but to simply say, well, I don't like 10, so we'll just throw this all away, um, is disregards the the position that puts workers in, uh, as well as all of the benefits that I've tabled it. You know, so much research, so much evidence to show why paid sick days actually, you know, is results in a more productive economy, makes businesses more resilient and productive, less sick days overall, because workers are not going into work sick, making other people sick. Um, to disregard all of that, uh, I think would be uh, just absolutely tragic. And um, I know, I know, I, I feel, I know we can do we can do better than that. So I would love to see someone be brave enough to say, okay, here's where we should start. Then, if not ten, where? And I will add to that. The word brave is kind of challenging, and it's a bit putting it back on us. This is not. This is not my bill that I put forward, right? So you brought the number 10. You're announcing the reasons why you put number 10. You're asking us, challenging us, to put a number forward um, to open that debate on that. I stated I don't know what that number is. I really don't without proper public consultation to find that balance of what would work here in Prince Edward Island. I can't just throw a number out and, and think that that's going to work. So that would be very unfair for me to do so. So I just want to make sure that um, that is on the record that mm -hmm. I will not be brave enough to just throw a number out there for the uh, collaboration of a bill passing without having that proper balance, employer, employee across Prince Edward Island. And I will just say mm -hmm. that I have provided strong evidence for why 10 is actually the number that's needed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I would love to see is us pass 10, because I do think that's what's needed. But um, if we can't get to 10, I do think we can make some progress. Now, I appreciate what you're saying, uh, but I also recognize that the easy way out is to simply ignore all of, all of the evidence, all of the groups who have spoken in support of this and, and stress the need um, to legislate paid sick days to protect workers. I think, you know, we, what we do here in this Legislative Assembly is debate legislation. Um, so if a discussion on the number of days is what the House wishes to have, if you say 10 is too much, but we do need paid sick days, we need to engage in that discussion. Um, did you want to add anything at this time? Okay. Okay, I, and I was okay. just going to reply. If, if I was, if you were brave and confident to use 10, mm -hmm. then there should be no openness to go with another number. So, that, but that's what I'm saying. So you're challenging me to saying that I'm not brave enough to put a number out there. But you're brave, and you're saying you're brave enough to put 10 out there as a number. But yet you're I willing am. to to negotiate that number. So, I, I need to have confidence in anything, any legislation that goes through this house that is going to benefit not only my district, but even as the economic development critic for the island, um, that it it's there to protect and in the best interest of all. That includes employers and employees. So I need to have that confidence that this bill, if it was 10 sick days, is going to, and I, I'll keep use, using the word balance, there needs to be balance here. So whenever you say that, I guess it is, it's that challenge that you're putting out here that I'm, I'm a little bit offended by because it's not my bill and I didn't do the consultation uh, to, to change that number yet. And, you know, I, I did ask in my district, and I can't use asking 10 people or, t or 10 businesses as a fair number to, um, to be accurate across Prince Edward Island. Mm -hmm. I just wish I knew what that number is. I'm not saying zero. I'm definitely not saying zero. But I cannot comfortably say a number 
between zero and 10 without having that, that confidence in doing so. Mm -hmm. I can come with 10 because it's evidence-based and that is what has come out of my mm -hmm. consultation. I'm confident mm -hmm. to stand by it. If others feel differently, you should s speak. Mm -hmm. uh, let us know what you think. Okay. Uh, sh are you waving again, Charlotte <laughs> Brighton? Or? Okay, Charlotte Brighton, you have the floor. Well, I wasn't going to put in a suggestion for a different number. I was going to put a suggestion in for 10 uh, because I been observing, I've been on PI a long time and there seems to be like a, the island seems to be divided in half. There's those that have the good jobs, government, crown corporations, maritime electric, big contractors, and I would say 10 or more is standard in all those things. So it is kind of a standard that the other half simply should be brought up to being a uh, people working in the service industry or grocery stores which don't have any benefits at all. Can, uh, let's not forget that sick days are just just one of the many benefits that the other half receive. Uh, we're not talking about everything like uh, longer, vac longer vacations or Blue Cross, Blue Shields or whatever. We're just talking about sick days and I think 10 is a good standard. Okay. okay, thank you for that. Okay, no further questions. I'm going to ask the question Shall the amended bill carry? Yes. yes. Okay, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. All those in favor? Uh, you can't do that until the speaker comes back in. So I'm going to uh, ask uh, all those in favor of the amended bill carrying, all those in favor of it. Please signify by raising your hand. So, okay. All those not in favor or against the amended bill going forward, please raise your hand. Okay, so the bill as amended will not carry. Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and let the chair report the bill not recommended. Shall I carry? Carry. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the bill to be in titual, an act to amend the Appointment Standards Act Number 4, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and does not recommend the same to the Legislative Assembly. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? Yeah. <coughs> Honourable members, there was a recorded division requested. Sergeant Arms, you may ring the bell. Six already wrote. Motion one twenty six. I have to go look for it. Oh yeah. Government's ready for the vote, Mr. Speaker. The opposition is ready for the vote. The third party is ready for the vote, Mr. All those voting against the bill, please. Against the report. Sorry. Thanks for the clarification. 
please stand. The Honorable Leader of the <coughs> Opposition, the member from Summerside Wilmot, member from Mermaid Stratford, the member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, the member from Charlottetown Belvedere, member from Charlottetown Brighton, the member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, and the member from Summerside South Drive. All those voting for the report, please stand. The Honourable Minister of Finance, the Honourable Minister's Minister of Fisheries and Community, the member from Morel Dona, the Honourable Deputy Premier, the Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, the member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, the Honourable Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, the Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, the Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing, the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness, and the member from Rustico Emerald, pardon me, the member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honourable Leader of the Third Party, the member from O'Leary and Verness, and the member from Tignish Palmer Road. The Honourable Member from Mermaids. Oh, sorry. Mermaid Strafford. Mr. Speaker, I ask that uh, motion 128 be now read. Sure, Carey. The Leader of the Official Opposition moves, seconded by the Member for Summerside South Drive, the following motion. Whereas the population of Prince Edward Island has, rapidly, has been rapidly growing primarily through immigration, which with a rich diversity of new islanders living in every corner of the province. And whereas it is critical that we act to recognize and value the contributions of this increasingly diverse population, their lived experiences, and their hopes and dreams for the future. And whereas many immigrants cannot participate in our democracy through voting, as they are not yet Canadian citizens. And whereas immigrants pay taxes, are subject to our laws, and contribute substantially in many meaningful ways to our society and our economy. Mm -hmm. And whereas providing an opportunity to better understand and be able to participate in civics will help with retention of immigrants to the province by ensuring that their voices are heard. And whereas municipal and school board representation is often the first step to political engagement. And whereas the Municipal Government Act and the Education Act are within provincial legislative jurisdiction. Therefore, be it resolved that this legislature supports extending voting rights to all permanent residents for municipal elections and school board elections in Prince Edward Island. And therefore, be it further resolved that the legislature urge government to consult with affected communities and stakeholders and bring forward the legislative changes required to expand voting rights to permanent residents in Prince Edward Island. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition to Thank start you. debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recognising that we only literally have a minute or two to talk to this debate, I think I will use my time to, uh, to recognise a couple of people in the gallery with your indulgence. Um, and one in particular, because this motion actually came through the policy development process of the Island Green Party. And it was originated by Bethany Collicut McNabb, who is sitting in the gallery today. Bethany is a teacher who teaches English as a second language to uh, New Islanders, and she was struck by how many of those New Islanders were extremely engaged and extremely knowledgeable about our democratic system and the way that politics wor works here on Prince Edward Island. But she was also struck by the fact that none of these students was able to vote. Uh, they were permanent residents here in Prince Edward Island but could not vote. And that's where the origins of this motion came from, Mr. Speaker. Again, I recognize we're not going to be able to carry this any further in debate, but I really appreciate the work that Bethany did. And I see also Susan Hartley here as the president of the Island Green Party, who was instrumental in developing the policy development process we now have. And this is a good example of how grassroots democracy can bring an issue in the public here into the House of the People and have it debated. I now adjourn debate, seconded by Summerside South Drive. Thank you. Sure, Karen. The Honourable Member from Mermaid 
Morale Donna and the Government House Leader. Speaker, well done. That was a good minute was spent getting that in there. So I look forward to that debate when the time comes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move uh, motion uh, 126 be read. Shall Mr. Speaker, motion 126, thanking our first responders, is currently under debate, and debate was adjourned by the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Winslow. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Winslow, Governor Whip, to resume debate. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, uh, I think I just barely started this uh, last time, um, so uh, you know it, it is an absolute pleasure to rise and move this motion, Motion 126, thanking our first responders. You know they always deserve uh, thanks and appreciation, and uh, you know I think that was highlighted a little bit more, of course, uh, after Hurricane uh, Fiona. Um, and the number that I mentioned uh, previously, and just really want to emphasize that in communities right across our island, Mr. Speaker, we do rely on the network of our approximately 1,300 volunteer firefighters, not to mention uh, the number of uh, professional firefighters, especially here in the Charlottetown area. Um, it's men and women in communities right across the province. They sacrifice both their time and effort. Uh, and they all, uh, often court the physical risks in exercising their duties, and I know, Mr. Speaker, you're uh, very familiar with this. Um, our first responders deal with things that you know most people wouldn't want to deal with. They deal with house fires, um, that accidents, okay. uh, vehicular accidents, responding to water incidents, and those are just some of the run-of-the-mill calls that our firefighters would regularly feel on a daily basis. Now, what they were encountering during Hurricane Fiona was uh, a different level, I think, for a lot of people. And as I mentioned last week, Mr. Speaker, where this motion came from was uh, when we were in standing committee uh, over the last couple of weeks when we heard from EMO and the fire marshal's office and um, Maritime Electric all about the extraordinary things that they faced during the storm. And um, Mr. Speaker, the health, uh, health and Social Development uh, Committee, it was the way that the, the chamber was set up, I had the uh, pleasure of sitting where the uh, honorable uh, member from Raldona is uh, sitting right now. And to my left was Dave Rossiter. And when he talked about, uh, he's the provincial fire marshal, as you know. And when he talked about, um, you know, just the, some of the challenges that they were faced and, you know, and just the, the respect and, and I could hear his passion. And you talk to any first responder and like, you know, that is their passion, is to be those first responders on the scene and some of the things that they have to see and they have to deal with, you know, you wouldn't really wish it upon anyone. Um, some of the things specifically to Hurricane Fiona that we heard the first responders answering calls for were um, full structure fires. I, I know that a lot of people had seen the picture, uh, pictures on Facebook uh, when it was loading uh, during Hurricane Fiona, but uh, the San uh, Golf and Country Club, like, just and you know, uh, and again, not to put words in, in uh, Fire Marshal uh, Rossiter's words, but he said it was so frustrating, um, you know, showing up at the scene and not being able to actually get there because of the amount of uh, storm surge that was coming in uh, off Santa Bay. Um, you know, the kitchen fires. Sometimes they would deal with carbon monoxide incidents, uh, removal of the down trees, of course, and the other debris that um, was kind of hindering their their uh, progress. Um, you know, any of the calls that would be challenging on their own, but dozens of these calls were coming in at the same time, and, you know, the, the challenge rises, so those first responders, again, they, they made, they did such great work during Fiona, but they do this on a regular, everyday basis. Um, you know, it does take a lot of toll uh, on our first responders being out in the miserable and the dangerous conditions to all hours of the, the day and night, and they are away from their family at the time when they do go out, Mr. Speaker, and, you know, we, we, you talk to people who, you know, they say, oh, I, couldn't, I can't get over the winds, like, the winds are so strong, and the rain was just pelting down, and, you know, th those people, like, a lot of people were talking, we were inside our homes when uh, Hurricane Fiona was passing <laughs> through, but, you know, as mentioned, the first responders were out uh, in the elements and, you know, doing their job. Um, you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, I've never been a first responder myself, so I, I like I said, I, I feel bad talking about this issue because I'm really trying to talk, you know, from other, under other people's perspectives, and you know, that that a lot of times it doesn't do it any justice whatsoever, um, because again, you know, they're the first responders, they're the first pre people on the scene, and they they're the ones that you know they had those uh, images in their minds, and you know, again, like I said, maybe not being able to do and help out to their full extent. 
Um, you know, I, I can't imagine, Mr. Speaker, the courage, because I know, again, from experience, or from, from your experience, Mr. Speaker, you know, when that call comes in and, you know, there, there's not a second thought given, it's just, you know what, someone's in help, someone's in need, I, I, I am gonna, I'm going to do my, my job here and I'm going to jump out the door and, you know, you say goodbye and say uh, goodbye to your family members and you, you do that. So, Mr. Speaker, again, this is a very important motion, and, and I don't want to, uh, I, I love uh, in the debate when we get to hear from uh, some different members, and I know the seconder of the motion, um, you know, he, he's been bringing this up in the legislature a lot of times, you know, some of the devastation that, that happened out on the, on the North Shore uh, specifically, and, you know, I, I know he's probably talked with a lot of first responders in, in his district, and we'll want to uh, share some of those stories. So, Mr. Speaker, um, I just want to say that you know the gratitude for the efforts of our first responders is what inspired me to move this today and I'm hopeful that some of the other members of the House will also be very supportive of it Mr. Speaker and again uh, just in closing I do want to just say again a big giant thank you that I know many Islanders have uh, for all the efforts not only during Hurricane Fiona but on an everyday basis for all of our first responders so with that Mr. Speaker I say thank you very much. Rustical Ambrose. Podium, Podium please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and um, I, I think it's really so important that we have a motion like this on the floor to recognize our first responders, our volunteer firefighters, and the work they do across this province, especially in the light of disasters like Fiona. And so, of course, uh, it really is my pleasure to second this motion. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine, Mr. Speaker, that such a critical role in our province is held by volunteers, Mr. Speaker, and and uh, you know, often uh, often I'm invited to to attend uh, various uh, events at the uh, different fire departments around my district, and uh, and every time, Mr. Speaker, when I'm speaking, I, I call them the ultimate volunteer, because this this is not. Um, doing the, the, the important work that other volunteer organizations do where they go out and they give to their community, but they don't necessarily put their safety at risk when it comes to our first responders, our responders, our volunteer firefighters, Mr. Speaker. When they respond to events, they are putting their safety at risk every single time. And, and I don't mean just their physical safety from the events that you would expect, whether they're going out to, uh, speeding down the road with the sirens flashing and, and going into the fight fires or going into a place and a situation where they don't know what's going to happen. But of course, there's the physical side and there's the mental side, Mr. Speaker. So it's so, so important to recognize these people that volunteer and do this. And I want to commend the member from Charlottetown Winslow for bringing this motion. Uh, to the floor. Um, I, I wanted to, to talk about the different fire departments that do serve the District uh, 18 Rustico Emerald and there's the New London uh, Rural Community uh, Fire Company, the New Glasgow Fire Department and the North Rustico Fire Department. And these, uh, uh, just, just before I, I get into their Fiona response, Mr. Speaker, I just want to talk about how humble, really, our volunteer firefighters are and first responders that work in, in, in these areas. Uh, these are people that go out and they, they work very hard at their day jobs, and then they dedicate hours and hours and hours. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, in order for them to get any sort of... Uh, you know, comp compensation for the work they do. And I, I know I don't have to tell you because you are, of course, a long, long time volunteer firefighter, but these volunteer hours are required in order to get the small, uh, I mean, I don't even think compensation is the right word for it. Um, things like, uh, you know, free 
uh, drivers or pre pre license registration for their vehicles and things like this. And if there's anything that uh, we can do to support firefighters more, I think we should do it. And I'm going to talk a little bit later on about a couple of uh, fire, volunteer firefighters and first responders that actually traveled to an international conference. Uh, but along those lines, I wanted to, I wanted to read a post uh, that was on the, the New Glasgow Fire Department Facebook page from September 24th, 2022. It was posted at 11.48 p.m., okay? So uh, as you can imagine, September 24th, this is right in the, just, just after the heart of, of Fiona has passed. And I mentioned that they're a very humble group, um, first responders and firefighters. And, and this, this was posted, um, I, I believe it was by the fire chief, although I'm not 100% certain, because they didn't, uh, it, was, it was the administrator of, of the page, but I'll, I'm just gonna read it verbatim. <clears throat> it was a quote, don't normally post about our emergency calls we attend dot 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 but I want to put a big thank you out to all firefighters across the island along with EMS and 911 call takers and police and indeed to my department members who attended 11 calls since midnight last night exclamation mark the dispatch radios have been going steadily all night and day island wide the craziest winds and rain yet we still jump and run out the door when the pagers beeps, dot, dot, dot. Just to give you an idea how we spent the last 23 hours, dot, dot, dot. We rescued a farmer off a barn roof with our aerial ladder, helped evacuate families whose roof was ripped off and houses flooded, cardiac arrest call, two major structure fires, water rescue call of a stranded vehicle on washed over road, Trees falling over on a camper at a campground. And besides all that, there were members who spent hours cutting trees and moving them off the road so we could have access around our fire district in case of other incoming calls. If you want to be part of a team that never stops helping others in need, join a fire, fire department near you. Exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. Busiest day I had in 30 years at the hall and looking forward to a good night's sleep. So, Mr. Speaker, like I said, the, these uh, volunteer firefighters, uh, except I think amongst themselves, don't really go, uh, they, and they, they, they respect privacy, and they don't go around the community talking about all the things they do, and I know you know that, Mr. Speaker, but this was such an extraordinary event, and the, the effort that was put forward during Hurricane Fiona and, and the, the resulting devastation was just so far above and beyond anything that our volunteer firefighters had and all our fire departments and first responders had, had uh, responded to before. This person, and I believe it was the chief of the New Glasgow Fire Department, felt they had to comment and say it. And you notice, Mr. Speaker, they didn't talk about just their fire district or just the fire districts in the area, like in New London, North Rustico, they were saying across the island. And so, Mr. Speaker, that's why this motion is so important. These volunteers are going out and they are helping and standing side by side the professionals often arriving before them. And you'll, you'll notice in, in, the, uh, in the post, he talks about EMS and 911. They are, they are Although they're volunteers and they're, they're unpaid for the work they do, in many ways they are professionals and in many ways they are the backbone of our emergency response service. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that. I think it was really important to, to get that into the record here today. And I just also want to highlight that anything that we can do as government to ramp up supports for our, our fire departments is something we should do. And, and Mr. Speaker, I know that many others in this, this uh, assembly are also passionate. I know the, the Minister of Fisheries and Communities has done a lot of work. I know that the Minister of, of Agriculture and Land Justice and Public Safety and, and the Attorney General, the former one, did amazing work there. And I know the, the new minister there will do it. And, and I, I know that everyone in, the, in, 
in our, our caucus, definitely, and in cabinet, um, was passionate about that. And but I want us to continually to look for ways that we can help them. Uh, one comment on that post, Mr. Speaker, on Facebook that I also wanted to read out um, is something that's really important to acknowledge, and and I think it has been acknowledged at every um, fire department gathering I've been at. But it is extremely important because you have the people that are going out and they're risking their lives, in many cases, and their mental health to provide emergency response. But there's always someone at home. And those people at home are as much a part of that team as, as the people who are out in the field. So this was the quote. <clears throat> it was also very difficult for our spouses to watch us go out the door in the dark and wind. Thanks for understanding what we do and why we do it. And that's another reason why this motion is, is so important because it's important, as, as they say here, to understand what we do and why we do it. Um, it's just important to recognize the fact that it's being done. Without that post on Facebook, Mr. Speaker, how would, how would all of us that benefited from the work of these people, even knowing all of the different things that they had to do? And you'll notice this is, this is not, um, there's one specific thing, you know, we're a volunteer firefighter, what we do is we get in a truck, we drive to a fire, we pull our hose, we put out the fire. They were cutting trees off roads. They were you know, rescuing, rescuing a stranded vehicle from a, a washout on a road. Um, there were cardiac arrest, arrest calls. They were doing a myriad of emergency response items. And, and Mr. Speaker, I just asked, I, I salute every single volunteer, firefighter, and first responder that we have across this province for the work that they did. Now, Mr. Speaker, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the new, un new London uh, Rural uh, Fire Company. Um, I would assume that their experience was much like that post on Facebook from New Glasgow, but um, I know they were one of the ones that really advocated uh, for supports that are going to help in the aftermath of Fiona and, and for any future uh, disasters, God forbid. So one thing that they did was um, uh, the Urban Company, um, you know, they did a, they did a number of, uh, of uh, fuel giveaways. They said, we want to provide fuel to people uh, for free who are dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Fiona. And as we know, that was one of the major, major expenses that people um, had had to face in Fiona, which was the price of fuel is high, and if you're running a generator, that's what you, you had to run it on, whether that was propane or, or, or gas. So um, the New London um, Rural Fire Company stepped up, and they, uh, they provided their location at the New London Fire Department um, to, to do the fuel giveaway. And they did it extremely well on very short notice. Um, they have an excellent location at the corner of uh, Graham's Road and Route 6. And um, they, from all accounts that I've heard, it was a seamless, seamless operation, extremely well organized. I wouldn't expect anything less from that fantastic uh, fire company. And, um, and Mr. Speaker, um, I, I was talking to the, the chief, and, and I said, you know, chief, is there anything that you need at, at your, your fire department to, to you know, that, that's missing. And he's always advocating, as all fire chiefs are. They're always looking to improve things for their whole team. Um, he said, well, the one thing that we'd really like is, is a, a street light at the entrance to the, the fire department uh, driveway. There's one at the corner, but we need a street light there. And uh, I mean, I might glance over here at the Minister of Transportation Infrastructure, but if, if you can get them that street light, that would be fantastic. I, I had some conversations with the department earlier. I think they're waiting for a call at the New London Fire Company, but if you can expedite that, thank, thank you, Minister, that would be great. Question now. It's a simple request, 
uh, Mr. Speaker, but sometimes it's the simple things that add just the massive amount of value. So the other thing, um, and, I, and I believe the new London Fire Department was one of the was one of the key instigators in this, was they they lobbied for for generators that they could have at the fire department to help out people in need during future events um, or or at any time really. And so I want to commend um, uh, cabinet and the minister responsible for for coming up with up to 15 generators per fire department on the island and um, they've all been up. and they have all been poked up well thank you minister they've all been picked up and they i i mean uh, so alan cole that's the chief of the new london fire department was quoted as saying the generators will come in handy during events like post-tropical storm fiona which knocked out power to virtually all of pei so this is an, an, an example of of an action a request that was asked for by the fire department and kudos to the minister and cabinet who came through and made this happen and here we are eight weeks since fiona and it's already been done and all the generators are out there so well done well done all those are the sort of things we need to look for so mr speaker uh, it was it was interesting because um there was an international women in fire conference that was being held this fall and um you, you know, a lot of people, when they think firefighter, uh, forget that uh, it's not just men, it's women. And there's a lot of fantastic women firefighters. And uh, in fact, the North Rustico Fire Department had the first female fire chief on PEI, Alison Larkin. I want to recognize her again for that. Um, and then there's, there's, there's several uh, women firefighters uh, on, uh, in, in my area. Um, in fact, I'm probably going to miss some of them, but I know in North Rustico Fire Department, uh, uh, Aubrey McDonald and Laurie Dempster are a couple. Apologize to those I might be missing. Apologies, I should say. Um, but there were two, uh, two firefighters from New Glasgow that wanted to attend this International Women in Fire Conference. And I believe it was down, um, I believe it was in Florida or somewhere in the southern U.S. So that was uh, Julia Summers and Megan Court. And so they took it upon themselves to raise the money that was needed to get the, the flights down there and pay for the conference itself. And, uh, and Mr. Speaker, I have to point out that they were the only volunteer firefighters that attended the International Women of Fire Conference. Everybody else there did that for a living and they were paid firefighters. So I want to give kudos to them. I want to recognize them for making that happen. Um, and, and you know, in the future, when those sort of things uh, come up. I'm hoping that our government can step forward and maybe provide a few more supports for them. I, I'm not sure they really uh, got that much help from government. So I'm gonna lobby for in advance that, uh, that we support those things in the future. I think it's important. But it was, um, it, was really, uh, it was really interesting to see, well, two things. First of all, the community support to support um, these ladies going to that conference was incredible and they they actually signaled out they said they said it was our fellow firefighters who were the ones that provided them the most supports mr speaker they you know bought tickets on their draws bought our leftover stock um and and, and those sorts of things but the other interesting thing mr speaker is guess when the conference was it was actually during hurricane fiona so they were down at the conference on on, on september 23rd uh, was the day three of that conference and uh, their 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 Facebook post was uh, they said first of all uh, a little bit about the conference and the experience they were having um, talking about leadership mindset and the history of women in fire courses and how lucky they were to be there um, but they also said of course we are thinking of our fellow firefighters at home gearing up for the weather stay home this is before Fiona hit uh, but that that's what firefighters are they're always thinking about others they're always doing for others and they're always trying to make themselves better so they can help others um, yes it, it was in Florida um, so even though they they weren't here for Hurricane Fiona um, the Florida heat uh, was 90 plus degrees and uh, they, they started at 6 to 6 15 a.m. and they did a whole number of activities so it, it was, it was very useful, and I, once again, I want to put a, a plea out here 
to support those sort of uh, uh, endeavors from our firefighters in the future. More support. Um, and I should mention as well, uh, Mr. Speaker, it was, uh, they actually had to bring their uniforms, their bunker gear with them when they flew down to the firefighter conference. And so that, that, was, uh, that was really something, 200 pounds of luggage that they took with them to be prepared. Um, Mr. Speaker, I've talked a lot today about how important it is to provide support to our firefighters. And one thing I wanted to uh, talk about was, was a time when we collaborated in this Legislative Assembly um, under the last administration. Uh, the leader of the third party was minister, I believe, at the time, responsible for uh, the Workers' Compensation Board. And the Minister of Fisheries and Communities brought a private member's bill to the floor. And that was to um, really uh, make it so that island workers who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder could actually qualify for workers' compensation. And so I, I want to give kudos to the Minister of Fisheries and Communities, the leader of the third party, and all those uh, who, who work together to make that happen. Because un unlike this administration in this sitting, it was extremely rare for a private member's bill to be brought to the floor and passed. So that, that was something we put our volunteer firefighters and others that, that serve and experience post-traumatic stress disorder. We put them at the forefront. We overcame um, any differences, and we worked together to make that happen. And that, that, of course, is the way the Legislative Assembly should work. And so, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I just want to want to say again that, uh, uh, as the mover noted, and, and I'm hoping other speakers will get to attest to uh, at some point, our first responders really are some of the finest members of our communities. Honourable Member, it's a minute or two left. <laughs> Keep going, Honourable Member. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Great motion. And, and, and we can probably never, we, we can never fully thank, thank them for what they do for us every day. But I am so extremely pleased to support this motion, to support our firefighters and our fire volunteer fire departments and everyone that helps out. And I really encourage all members to do the same. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, the hour has been called. <laughs> You want to uh, adjourn debate? Honorable member, adjourn debate with a uh, seconder. Honorable member, Rusty Cow. I would like to uh, move that adjourn debate be adjourned, uh, seconded by the uh, Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture. Shelley Carey. <laughs> Honorable member from Morel Dona and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty, oh, that this house yeah. adjourn until November 23rd <laughs> at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Sean Carey. Carey.